Good evening, everybody. Shall we make a start? I, I notice we are missing one of our members uh, for the committee. I think we're going to have to make a start anyway, because we've got a quite a long agenda, so she'll just have to join us and sort of and watch, I think. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, East Area Planning Meeting for Stratford District Council. My name is Danny Kendall. I'll be chairing tonight's meeting in accordance with the rules and uh, procedures as set out on the inside page of your agenda tonight. Um, few introductions, I think, from the top of the table. On my far right is Liz Javorska from Committee Services at Stra uh, Stratford District, then Mason Nash, who's our legal representative tonight. On my left is Dale Barker, he's our planning manager, and then we've got Neil Hempstead, David Jeffrey, and uh, Victoria Chadaway, who are all uh, planning officers here at Stratford District and will be presenting various applications for us tonight. So, there are introductions out of the way. Um, before we go any further, if I could just remind members of the public, please, to make sure your mobile phones are turned off or, or certainly to silent. That would be fantastic. Um, and also to make you aware of the fact that we're filming tonight's meeting, so it is being uh, live webcast on the website. Um, and should you, for whatever reason, wish to go back and have another look at it tomorrow, um, it will be available for you on the website as well in the next day or two. Um, right, item one, apologies for absence, please. None received, Chairman. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, disclosure of interests. Right. I, n I notice that pretty much all of our committee tonight are going to be stepping down from uh, proceedings. If I could just ask you to give me the uh, item number that you'll be stepping down from, Councillor yeah. Mills. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be stepping down from uh, uh, application number on seven on the agenda, Mr. Chairman, but I will be speaking. And uh, on application uh, on number 10, I've had um, communication by email from... Uh, objectors actually on this application. Thank you. Did we all have? That's fantastic. So we'll note that for everybody on application 10. Um, Councillor Fielding, did you indicate as well? Yes, uh, item 10, uh, 17.01284. And one, Just the item is okay. So item 10? Yeah, both those two I will be standing down. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Barnes. Yeah, that, I should be going early if that's all right. Well, as long as we're quiet, I've got to make sure we are. Um, Councillor Crump. Yeah, item number nine, I'll be st stepping down, but speaking. As ward member, thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Donnell, and you made it, thank you. I, I apologise for being late, all right. um, Chair. Um, I will be speaking on behalf of residents um, on application eight. And you're also going to represent the parish council for that yeah. one as well as Warden. Yes. Right? yes. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Right. If there are no further declarations of interest, uh, do I have your? Um, do you agree that I can sign the minutes of the meetings on the fourth and the twenty-fifth of October? Thank you. Lovely. I'll do that at the end. I think I might actually have to ask our vice chairman to sign the minutes for the last meeting because he chaired that one. So, if you make sure you do that at the end for me. Thank you. All right. Um, Right, our first application tonight, this is item 4, found on page 17 of your agendas. Uh, that's application reference then. 17-00632-FUL, uh, uh, Ladbrook Farm, Ladbrook Road, Bishop Sitchington, and for the proposed change of use of redundant agricultural barn to a holiday let and associated works. Uh, presenting officer, Neil Hempstead. Neil, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the application site is shown on the screen with the, with the black dot. Um, now, members will be aware that this application has been to committee on a number of previous occasions um, and has been subject to a member's site visit, which took place on the 2nd of August. Um, so the general location is approximately 0 0.7 kilometres to the northeast of Bishop Sitchington. And just looking at that in a bit more detail, there's a settlement of Bishop Sitchington there. So the red line extends the access to the, to the public highway up until the, to the location of the barn there. Um, just to point out a few, a few key points on the plan, um, there's a public footpath which runs along the, the access and then goes, follows just where the curse is going. I'll be referring to some um, residential properties which are referred to in the committee report which are in the location there. And that is the, the Chiltern line just running across there, of which there goes over a bridge and the access goes under it just through there. I've got some photographs to show that. And just to give members a context in terms of an aerial photo, again, um, Bishop Sittington here, that is the, the access that I refer to. The barn is there. And 
just looking ahead into the presentation, the, the, the photographs which are coming forward, just to give you some context of that, I've got one of the barn um, and a northern section of the access which takes in the railway bridge which is there and there I'll refer to a gate which is referred to in the committee report and that is just shown there. So just going into the photographs, this is the existing barn. So it's stone built um, with a corrugated metal roof and there is a concrete apron hard standing to the front which I'll refer to on the plans later on. So this is the first photograph which is the, um, the bridge which carries the, the Chiltern line. So this is looking north going upwards towards the barn. And then further down this is the the access gate that I referred to, and again, looking north. Um, the importance of those last two photographs is just to show the access there and the existing grass treatment. Um, now, there is a condition that has been referred to in the update sheets where um, there would be a recommendation for details, if granted, of the surfacing to be provided. Reference has been made to uh, grass crete in the committee report. And from this, and if we turned around looking southwards, it's approximately this, this area that the, the hard standing of the existing access which serves the dwellings approximately ends. And so this photograph just shows where the, um, the access comes out onto the Labbrook Road. And members will be aware that there was a previous refusal um, to use the, the barn as a permanent dwelling um, and you can note the, the, the large size of the um, curtilage which was supplied with that application. Now work has been undertaken in respect to that and, and members will note that the um, curtilage is, is far smaller now. The proposed work on site is the access and some parking areas which will, are proposed to be in, um, in grass crete. Um, there'll be existing grass areas will be maintained. There'll be a 1.2 metre high post and rail fence. And if I can just zoom in, one of the key changes is a delineation of this area here, um, outside which no further um, buildings or, or anything will be grown outside to maintain the, the, um, the character of the area. So just moving on, these are some of the existing elevations. So the photograph shows the existing barn with the, with the opening there and you can see the, the other fairly standard elevations. In terms of the proposed works to the barns itself, there isn't any difference between what was previously proposed to have it as a permanent dwelling and, and what is proposed now. So effectively the area would be, it's approximately 29 square metres, not including the, the bed deck which is to be included. So it's a fairly modest size which would consist of a kitchen, shower and a living area with the, um, uh, effectively a mezzanine put in I would imagine for, for a bed deck there. In terms of exterior works, there would be roof lights put in, um, some glazing to the opening which you saw in the photograph and some existing, uh, and some glazing to an existing stone detail in the building there and a new roof put on. <coughs> Chairman, there are three updates as detailed, detailed in the update sheet which includes confirmation of the size of the floor space which I've referred to and changes to some of the proposed conditions. Chairman, the recommendation is to grant planning permission with the conditions and notes as detailed in the committee report and in the update sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Right, should we have our first speaker on this one? Um, we've got Councillor Will, uh, Wilson and Councillor Dugmore from Bishop Sitchington Parish Council. Hello. Welcome both. So you have three minutes between you. Do you both intend to speak? Or is uh, one of you here for just questions, or? Okay, so you have. Okay, you're just. <laughs> I'm sure you're not. Don't worry. So um, you've got three minutes. If you remain seated for any questions at the end, um, and I'll give you a warning in the last ten seconds, if that's okay. All right. Over to you. Of course, we've got those. 
Of course. Fantastic. And if you'd press the button in the middle so we can have the microphone on. Thank you. Over to you. Contrary to that claim, this is not a sustainable community-led development. It does not consider the wider or future permanent material harm on residents, in particular their privacy, the harmful impact on the social amenity, character and ultimate safety of the neighbourhood. We have been informed that residents of Words Lane have not received their site notices from the applicant's agent and accordingly bring this to your attention. Our objection is the use of the footpath SM197 as the access to the site, which we consider to be unsustainable due to the negative impact that this use will have. Works Lane is a public footpath with vehicle access for those granted permission by the owner, Follets. This includes residents of Works Lane who contribute to its maintenance. Contrary to the case officer's report, which states the gate does not need to remain open at all times, it is the landowner and network rail who require the gate to be locked at all times for safety and security purposes, as the railway is the main line to London. It is not proven that the application complies with WCC fire and rescue requirements in terms of access for emergency vehicles, let alone construction vehicles. A narrow railway bridge bisects the footpath near the barn, preceded by a 90-degree bend. There is no hammerhead turning point or 19.2-metre turning area. This green lane links Bishop Sittington to Depper's Bridge. It provides a wildlife corridor and is a much-used safe local amenity for pedestrians and dog walkers between the settlements. From the gate, 90% of the footpath surface is grass and mud, with an irregular camber, horizontal plane and widths. In our opinion, these impediments will prevent emergency vehicles getting to the barn and may also prevent clients getting to the barn. Ladbroke Barn is isolated, nowhere near a public bus route. The only ingress and egress is by motor vehicle or on foot, a half-mile walk. The proposed glazed frontage of the barn is out of character and overlooks the footpath. If required, it would be better on the opposite side, looking across the vista. Plan 04D shows use of grasscrete, but not the extent of its use. An additional entrance and gate is also shown as a means of accessing the site from the footpath, and we question why this is necessary. The number of parking spaces is contradictory. The size of this development only merits parking for one vehicle, as stated in the applicant's design and access statement. There is no evidence to support the case officer's statement that I consider as a holiday let the residential use would be less intense. Residents will endure nuisance, increased traffic and noise. Their safety, security and privacy will be unnecessarily compromised when access from the applicant's own land is totally feasible. If the committee is minded to grant this application despite its inconsistencies and planning objections, we request that the whole condition be quite specific by stipulating maximum durations of occupancy on an annual basis to prevent the development being used as a residential dwelling. Thank you. Any questions for the Parish Council? No? In that case, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we go to the next speaker. I've got Sue Lloyd, please, uh, speaking on behalf of the residents of Works Lane, objecting. Oops. Hello. Hello. So, the same rules apply. I believe you've got slides as well, so if you just indicate to us when you want us to change them. Have you not? Okay. All right. No, no mind. So, you have three minutes. If you remain seated for any questions, should we have them at the end? You just press the button in the middle. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Could I ask you just to angle it down slightly towards yeah. you? Not too far. That's fine. And okay. there's no need to speak into it too much. Okay. But over to you. All residents of Works Lane would like it noted we still have not been served formal notice of this application. Certificate B on the plans is still incorrect. Impact on neighbours, policies state neighbouring properties and the character of the local landscape be protected from unacceptable impacts. We are an established community living in a secluded and tranquil area of countryside with no through traffic on a single track. We feel secure with a lock gate providing a dead end and outsiders do not know we live there. The impact of tourists will be detrimental to our peaceful enjoyment of our lives. Safety and security will be compromised by unknown vehicles day and night. Increased traffic outside our home will cause material harm to us and the environment with extra dust and exhaust pollution. Footpath SM197 is mainly a dirt track from the top to the bottom. Potholes will occur more frequently and will further erode the unstable ground. 
Noise levels will increase when locking and unlocking the padlock gate, engines running and car doors closing. And if the gate's not secured, there is a real risk of trespass and antisocial behaviour on the land and the railway line, reasons why this gate is now constantly padlocked. Councillor Kettle's statement at the previous meeting clearly demonstrated this proposal was not a sustainable development. It does not meet with the core strategy. The applicant's agent also justified it was not economically or financially viable as a holiday let in the previous application which was refused. The impact on our community and the landscape will be worse than a residential dwelling as tourists come and go more frequently and research shows we have plenty of adequate holiday lets. The barn's historic age used by cattle and other wildlife should be preserved. Developing the barn to a holiday let with the material suggested is out of character with its environmental landscape and will be seen from the highway, spoil the view and disturb the wildlife that live on the site. Developments for tourism need to support rural services. This will not. The case officer tried to justify this development meets with policy but used assumptions, not evidence it does. Emergency access. Visit by an experienced fire appliance driver. Access after the gate towards the barn is not practical because there's no hard standing, narrows in places with overhanging trees and no turning circle. Appliances should not be driven off-road. It will not meet access requirement for fire and rescue vehicles Part B5 and ambulances will face similar difficulties. We hope committee refuse this application as your site visit will have shown it's too small, not practical or sustainable with significant harm being inflicted on our established community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, please? Yes, Councillor Fielding. Um, <clears throat> the, does the access road then have access up onto the railway line for emergency repairs? They can just, they leave it, they tend to leave the, the um, railway line, comes down, parks at the gate and walks through. They sometimes do have their small vehicles. If they bring their large vehicles, they tend to stay parked at the gate. Councillor Mills. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Hello, good evening. The, um, you said that the road um, leading up to the proposed application, um, is it not used at all by any vehicles? It hasn't been for a long time. So, so no farm? Occasionally a farm vehicle does go. Yeah. But very, very occasionally. Okay, thank you. Councillor Parry. Thank you. Good evening. Could you just explain... Um, in terms of the refuse collection from your properties by nearby the gate, what is the procedure for, does, do you have to bring your bins out near the gate? No, our, our, our refuse is actually put at the end of our drives and it's collected with the big cart. So in other words, the, the, the refuse vehicle can't come up past your properties it goes on the, that lane? It goes to the end and it has to do a, a big, it turns about four times to get round to come back out again. We don't actually have the large refuse truck either. They bring a smaller one down because they can't turn the big one down. Okay. There are no further questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, okay, our next speaker is uh, the ward member, Councillor Kettle. Welcome, Councillor. <laughs> You've had plenty of time to prepare your notes on this one, I think. So, you know the routine. You have five minutes. Um, if you remain seated for any questions at the end, over to you. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I just wanted to get the machine to work properly. Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is what could be described as a sensible conversion of a redundant farm building. It is redundant without doubt. The officer reports and build on this redundancy, highlighting three policies, AS10, CS22 and CS24, to persuade you that this application has merit and is therefore sustainable. Um, as you're aware, the applic application is almost identical, uh, which Neil has referred to, to a previous, re previous refused residential application. It was refused not just because of CS15, but for being unsustainable, partly because of the impact on the landscape, CS9. This application, despite the officer's comments, is contrary to CS24, paragraph 3, landscape, and paragraph CS24, paragraph 6, relation to the road network. In the early application, earlier application, the applicant's agent, the same one acting on this application, in response to a question from planning officer Ed Pickett, made the comment that a holiday let would not be financially viable. 
that means that CS22 economic development cannot be justified as a reason for approval. What has changed? Why is the impact of this with a marginally smaller footprint suddenly acceptable in the landscape and now viable and accessible when previously it was not? I have concerns on scale and setting. This is a very remote area. Access is challenging. The previous application was already refused on the size of this property, measuring 3.7 metres wide. That is about 12 foot by about 20 foot. Is that an acceptable design for a residential property, holiday let, or otherwise? We have clear policies, CS9 and CS5, as does the NPPF on ensuring good design and minimising the impact on landscape. Is circa 2, 250 square feet an acceptable size for a property? It has windows, main windows, only on one side, facing the London, Birmingham, Snow Hill Railway. The railway is less than 200 metres away, and on the other side of the property. The, the, the property has views onto an agricultural vehicle um, engineering recycling business, otherwise known as a field full of rusting combines, for those of you who did the site visit. Previously, the council refused this application on the impact on the countryside. The applicant then argued that a residential development would have less impact than a holiday let. Strange that that has now changed, that he wants to apply for a holiday let. I would also draw our attention to viability. Viability is fundamental to farm diversification. As I've already noted, the applicant has already said that a, a holiday let would not be viable on this site. How can we use policy CS22 as a viable diversification when, in the applicant's own words, he's already said a holiday let would not be viable? CS24 lists seven points to be met. In this case, CS24 focuses on the relationship to the local settlement and the benefits of the local community. Now, what is the benefit of the local community that would allow you to uh, approve this application? We haven't heard anything as to how the local community will benefit. Um, and in relation to the local settlement, the only thing we've heard is that the immediate res residents will have quite an impact of having a no-through road made open. And there's a second issue here about security. When you live at the end of a dead end, access is fairly well controlled. There's a, there's a padlocked gate there because there have previously been incursions onto the old cement work site adjacent to here by both travellers at one stage by an illegal rave. That padlock was put on the gate to ensure that could not happen. Now, how can you ensure the ongoing security of not only of the, the local residents' properties, but also the neighbouring site, which has got a history of trespass, if you remove the only security that's there? There's a padlock. You cannot expect holiday let people who have no long-term interest to ensure that security is maintained. This is a very small, very, very small building. We like to encourage farm diversification, but farm diversification into a, a business which the applicants already said is not going to be viable is grasping at straws. I think we can do better than approve this one. Those of you who saw it on the site visit, I remember one comment being made, it is very small, isn't it? For quite a lot of houses, the entire footprint will be smaller than the living room. Ten seconds. Um, <laughs> I think, Mr Chairman, I've said enough. Thank you. Okay, any questions for the ward member? Councillor Fielding. Who, at this moment in time, holds the key to the gate? Is it held by the old cement works at the other end, or is it held, held locally? Um, access to this site I'm, I'm gonna come is in. I'm used sorry. by... I'm, so, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you because who owns it and who has access to it is not really a planning matter, is it? And I've got, I'm going to try, and, and, and although I understand your frustration, I'm going to have to keep us to planning issues for this one, if that's okay. Did you have another question? Yes. There, well, the answer, to the, if, if there is a fire at the cottage and the holiday lets, are, people are up there, how are the gates going to be opened? I'm not sure, and again, with respect to you, Councillor Kettle, I'm not sure you're really in a position to answer that question, being that you're, unless you're moonlighting as a fireman, I'm not sure uh, you are. Um, 
Can, can I suggest we come back, that, back to that one as a point of clarification, if that's okay? Do we have any other questions for the ward member? In that case, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but thank you very much for your input. Um, should we go uh, straight to two points of clarification then? Um, Councillor Fielding, if we put your question across, if that's okay as a point of clarification, can you give us a little bit more? Oh, well, yes. Uh, do you have any additional information on the, how, the access in terms of emergency uh, units? The same thing, go. The Microphone, please. Council, oh, it's okay. Both the Council and the independent um, objector uh, mentioned the fire brigade. Uh, and on page 20, the fire brigade offered no objection subject to development and complying with guidelines laid out in building regulation approved document B, which I have before me. Quite right. um, and B5 of that uh, volume one document says there should be access for a pump appliance to within four to five metres of all points within the dwelling house. Um, I wondered if that's achievable. Should we now go to you, Neil? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, in terms of the uh, fire and rescue issue, um, you're quite right, Councillor, it is referred to in the, in the committee report, um, and, it, and it talks about um, I'll read it out, it's probably the easiest thing. Um, WCC Fire and Rescue have been consulted as part of the application and have responded to advise that should planning permission be granted, the proposals would require building regulation approval. And measures at that stage would need to address fire safety within the building, including a means of escape and fire suppression, or a turning area for a fire vehicle would be required alongside the building. It is anticipated, given the location of the site, that the, appli the applicant would seek to ensure on-site fire safety measures were installed through the building regulations approval. So effectively, what, what they would be seeking to do is have fire suppression within that building itself, rather than rely on a fire engine coming up that drive to reach it. I think that, that would actually be dealt with under the building regulations. Uh, Councillor, yes, Councillor Parry and Councillor Crump. Yes, I just wonder whether the officer can explain, uh, just to give me some greater clarity, as to obviously the previous application was reviewed as being unsustainable. Um, can they advise why they now feel the building is sustainable? I would welcome some clarity on that. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think the key issue... Um, and the key difference is that previously the proposal was for a permanent residential dwelling. Now that is different to um, a holiday let. And in respect of um, a permanent dwelling, it would be outside the, any of the built up area boundaries. And under policy, I think it was CS15, which was referred to in the, in the decision notice, um, it was considered to be unsustainable given its location, which, which is remote and within the countryside. I think the key difference here is now the use has changed and it's a holiday let, then under um, policy AS10 and CS24, that recognises that um, those sort of uses in the open countryside, subject to other criteria, are appropriate. So that is the key difference in terms of assessing the sustainability against those particular policies. Would, sorry, if I just come back to you on that point. If, um, I mean, I happen to have two holiday lets and they're occupied for over 44 weeks a year, okay? Would, if this was a holiday let and it was occupied for as many weeks per year, would that not actually equate to the same toing and froing as a residential? It would be almost the same as being its occupancy in terms of sustainability, or that just gets disregarded? It's, it's not a case of, of, of it being disregarded. I mean, there will be, obviously, there'll be toing and, and, and froing. It's, 
it's looking at the use per se, really, in terms of assessing that, because that, that's why the permanent residential dwelling, it's, it's contrary to the policy in, that, in terms of that location. The, the holiday let, in terms of um, you know, a tourist facility, um, that is viewed very differently, and that's looked at in terms of policy AS10 and CS24. And that, that's the key difference. There will still be movements associated with it, but it's, it's, it's the nuance of those different uses that, that are assessed. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go through a number of questions. Um, I've got Councillor Crump next, and I know the other people. That's okay. I don't know whether Councillor Parry has been copying mine or I've been copying her homework, but very similar questions. One was about the sustainability, but mine's going on a little bit further about the letting. What, uh, have we got any details of, will it be let permanently? Is it, or will it be closed? What's the proposed letting periods? Um, and can we potentially limit those letting periods if we're not happy that it's going to be open 52 weeks a year? And then I've got another question, not on there. Okay. Um, I haven't got details of what the, the proposed letting periods would be. Um, I mean, in terms of detailing that, we, we have got a, um, a condition that is applied to these types of um, permissions, should it be granted. Um, and, and I, can, I can read it to you. Um, it says, the development hereby approved should only be used for holiday accommodation purposes and not for any other residential use falling within Class C3, the Town and Country Planning Act. And any other residential use would include a personal person's main residence or permanent residential unit of occupation. It doesn't specify um, periods within that, but that is the word, that's the standard wording that's, that, that's used. But could we, if we were minded, could we limit the holiday let? If members have a, have a planning reason to put that on, then we could, yes. Um, and the other question is, it was mentioned both by the Parish Council and um, Sue Lloyd that um, the certificates have been served unless I miss that properly, uh, unless I miss that. So I just wonder what the implications were regarding that. Yeah, I think, I think we're just checking that for you and we'll come back to you on that. Go on, Mason. You can clarify that one. Well, not a decent one, Chair, but um, looking at the uh, document that Dallas has given me, it does appear that um, uh, whether they've actually been served directly or uh, they've actually been served um, because they have an interest by, uh, say, um, a resident um, who's actually on, acting on their behalf. So at some time, uh, under the actual certificate ownership process, they have been served. Um, it, it, it is a difficult one to explain, but um, in, in our view, the way we construe it, they have been served on notice, either by actual notice or by word of mouth. Okay. So they're aware of it, basically? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Councillor Crump, I'm not sure if you're happy with that, but we'll have to move through that. Is that okay? As much as I can. All right. Uh, now, Councillor Fielding, then Councillor O'Donnell, and you're back. Okay. It still um, doesn't answer the question which I'm concerned about is a locked gate and a property and who has control of the route. It's a private road, as I understand it, with a footpath. And has the certificate, does that make it clear that 
the, they have the right of access over that road, which is a private road. I'm going to ask, it's not a planning method, but I'm going to go to Mesa very quickly, if you could. Yeah, just quickly, Chair. From the documents I've seen, it could be construed uh, very much that they do have a right of access over that track. So if they have a right of access over the track, they would have a right of access or a right to the key to the gate. Okay. Councillor O'Donnell, then Councillor Mills, and Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Chair. Um, both the Parish Council and um, the independent objector mentioned their concern over the um, increased use and the state of the road. Who's responsible for maintaining the road? Which road? The, the, the access we can see yeah. here? Mm -hmm. it's, not, um, it's not a public highway, so it would be... Um, it would be the owner would be responsible for that. Mm. Yeah. Um, generally, yes, it would be the owner, but sometimes the people who have access, uh, access rights along that track would have to contribute mm. to the uh, maintenance. But I couldn't say for sure on this one. Okay. Yeah, and, and it is a public footpath as well. Yeah. Councillor Mills. Sorry to skip you earlier. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Actually, <coughs> going back onto the lettings again, you thought it would be, wouldn't you? Um, so, Neil, the theoretically, um, this could be let for 50 weeks of the year, because I understand you've got to, there's got to be two weeks where it's got to be empty. Is that right? Or have, I, have I got that wrong? Um, Sorry, Councillor. Shall um, we say it again? No. In, in, are you talking about the same person? being in there for 52 yeah. weeks. Or, or, yeah, but I understand it can only, if I've got it wrong, that a holiday let can only be let, can't be let for 12 months. It's got to be let for a maximum of 50 weeks a year, is that correct? It, it, it could be used for, for 12 months of the year as a holiday let. There's no reason why, why it couldn't. I think if you had the same person in there and they were using that continually, then you'd be looking at more of a permanent residence, but you can use it for, tw for 12 months as of the year as a, a holiday let. Yes. Thanks, Neil. To Thank come you. in there, I'm just going to clarify this. Way. Neil. Sorry, Neil. If that was the case, it, the planning, uh, inf our enforcement team at the District Council would be brought into the situation if it was being let, or as a holiday let out for a whole year to something, wouldn't it? Yeah, if there, if so there was... an enforcement matter. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that, has, that sort of issue has been investigated before by the enforcement team. So Right. So... Yes. There, there are ways of countering that later. Um, Dale, so, did you want yeah, to add to that point? If I may, Chair, yeah, yeah. just to add to that point. It would be entirely proper for members to impose a condition on the, the, any permission that, that, that it, it wasn't let to any one per person for more than a certain period, mm -hmm. say four weeks. So that would deal with your permanent occupancy condition, uh, issue and concern. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at thoughtful councillors at the moment. I think you're all putting something together in your head. Uh, Councillor Perry, then I've got Councillor Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just also another question relating back to the previous um, refusal, where it was highlighted that another major material consideration for the refusal was due to the impact on the landscape and character of the area. Can the officer explain how... Um, the, the, the change, uh, the building is actually going to be the same, how th this doesn't impact, in their view, on the landscape and character of the area. I think, and you're absolutely right, in terms of the tr treatment of the building, that, it, that is the same. Um, I think the key difference is, and, and the, the concern which came out in the, uh, the previous reason for refusal was the, the size of the, the curtilage and as it was used for potentially was going to be used for permanent residential it, it was the uh, how would you phrase it domestic paraphernalia you know washing lines etc etc which could be in there which then would change the um, character of the area and I think that's raised in the um, in the decision notice, where just, just paraphrasing, it says, due to the introduction of a domestic dwelling and its associated paraphernalia, which is, which is what was mentioned in the, in the, um, 
in the description and reason for, for refusal, coupled with the prominent location of the barn and the subsequent potential erosion of the rural character and landscape. So what the applicant has, has looked to do is significantly reduce that, the curtilage, so it's far tighter to the, to the barn. And also, as I, the, the point that I raised um, during the presentation, in terms of limiting to that area, so anything outside that area, they're saying they wouldn't have any additional um, planting or, or, or built form. So that's how they, the applicant has tried to overcome that, that refusal in terms of the character area. Councillor Barnes. Um, I've got 56 holiday lets in my small patch close to me. They've all got different conditions. One came to committee next to livestock. We got a rule on we couldn't be in there more than six weeks, so like lambing or calving or whatever. And that seems to have worked well. I believe that the committee can make the conditions. Uh, some we've got to 11 months. Some we've got uh, different ones on different uh, this, situations. I'm going to cut you off. Is this a point of clarification? Or are well, you sort of helping what I'm saying is I believe the committee can make the conditions if you want. Because they have been done in we'll my come back to that in just a moment because I think we're about to move to debate. Uh, anybody, any other points of clarification? Should we go to a debate on this? Does anybody want to start? Councillor Fielding. Microphone, please. Precedent where enforcement are jumping in when they've had somebody in occupation for a month, uh, even though the wording of the um, documentation is longer periods. Uh, my feeling is that this is basically a hovel designed to keep cattle out of the wet. It's in the wrong place. It's too much, too uh, much in the countryside. Unless you're a, a railway fanatic or a as pointed out, a rusty old agricultural thing from the other point of view. Um, I don't think it's, it should be, a, should go, be granted planning. And I'm, I'm proposed that we refuse it. Okay. Um, I'm get, I, I've got to, because you, you're proposing that we refuse it, I'm going to have to go get a second on that in a minute, but perhaps if I hold that off until we can maybe flesh out reasons perhaps uh, and see where the rest of the committee are going with this as well. Is that okay? So if we make a note that it's been proposed, we'll come back to it. We'll have to do it in order later. Um, okay. Anybody else want to speak in the debate? Sorry, Councillor Parry. Well, I might as well dive in if nobody else is. Um, this is, this is a, a difficult application, I think. Um, and I, t I do agree it is the wrong proposal and the wrong application in the wrong place. I have major concerns about the impact on the landscape um, and character of the area, despite um, very eloquent responses to my queries in respect to that from the planning officer. I do have major concerns regarding the access into the site. Um, you know, ho holiday lets actually uh, there's a reference to the committee report in terms of, oh, holiday let won't produce so much rubbish. Well, I can assure you most holiday lets um, do have an awful lot of rubbish because a lot of them tend to have takeaways and all that sort of paraphernalia. So the reference to in the committee report that the, the refuse would be significantly lower. I've got concerns about emptying and disposing of the... Um, the collection, the refuse collection, I also, um, because of its location, because of the necessity uh, in terms of health and safety grounds to have that gate closed from a security point of view, um, you know, with children perhaps getting up onto that railway line, um, it, it causes another um, issue. I also think the sort of toing and froing um, of, of traffic movements up to that gate and the frequency of it also has um, a disturbing fact on the immunity of the immediate neighbours nearby. Um, but I'm looking for some support on some additional um, sound planning reasons um, to refuse this. So I'll um, 
perhaps uh, we can we can strengthen what I've my my interpretation of the proposal in front of us. Councillor Crump, I just refer to page 22. Um, impact on the landscape and character of the area. Policy CS9 states that the proposal should improve the quality of the public ground and hence enhance the sense of place. I don't think it does. Um, are there any benefits to the community and relationship to the local community? Again, I don't think that's been um, demonstrated. Policy CS15 states all development in existing settlements is expected to protect and enhance the character of the settlement involved in its setting. I, in my opinion, it doesn't, and nor does the parish council, nor does the ward member. Policy AS10 states all proposals will be thoroughly assessed against the principles of sustainable development, including the need to minimise the impact on the character of the local landscape. Again, I don't think this does. Yeah, Councillor Paris touched on about the, um, the refuse, etc., and the waste. We've also touched on about it's 0.7 kilometres, I think it's 0.7 kilometres away down the track. Um, and I don't think it ticks any of the boxes, so I will be voting against this. Um, in order which I've seen, you've got Councillor Mills, then Councillor Barnes, then O'Donnell. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sure with this be a plan, it's a bit suspicious that the first one was turned down because it'd be permanent. Now they decided to be a holiday let. I'm just suspicious there, but you know we don't know. But um, I, I don't think this can work. I mean, you've got this locked gate. I, I know John Fielding's brought this up. Um, if, if there was an emergency, I, I, I can't see any uh, ambulances or whatever getting up there quickly. Um, I think Anne Parry's mentioned about children running up the, the, the rail, railway bank. I didn't think about that, but now as you said that, it sounds horrendous. So I, I don't think this is a good idea, Mr Chairman. Thank you. My apologies, I'm making notes. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Thank you. As I said earlier, I've got a lot of holiday lets in my patch, and uh, this isn't an ideal situation. It will, I think, harm the amenity there, particularly with the car parking, though it's going to be grass, it's still going to be cars there. In planning reasons, I think we've got a difficulty in finding reason for refusal. My concern is that if we do refuse it, it will do like a lot of others, go to appeal and then they'll go for a house, a permanent dwelling. It isn't an ideal situation. If you can put forward reasons for refusal, um, I mean, I could think of some for the amenity, the dustman, um, I had to deliver a baby at last Christmas, big Christmas before last, because the host ambulance was going to be 38 minutes. So, there's the, you, uh, so services for that sort of thing is not a planning reason, but it does will have an effect on the beauty, if you like, of the area, the parking, uh, and it will be an intrusion to the neighbours. So uh, I'm not happy with it at all. Okay, Councillor O'Donnell, I'll come back. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I'm seconding Councillor Crump and Councillor Parry and actually Councillor Barnes and Councillor Mills. I have concerns regarding the security. Um, I don't understand the reasoning with the sustainability holiday let. Um, we would need to put a condition on that because somebody could actually rent that for 50 weeks of the year and it's more or less permanent. I don't see also how you'll easily police that with it being such a remote setting, dealing with a lot of enforcement in my ward for people whose holiday lets go over four or five weeks. It's not that easy to actually police. Um, and also, I think it has a really negative implication for the neighbours, and it will impact on their, on their um, whole living environment. Um, and I don't, I'm not convinced about the fire safety. I don't think you can rely on, a ho on when people are on holiday let to follow the safety procedures of fire suppression when they're on holiday. I think it's really quite worrying that both an ambulance and a fire engine probably would not be able to access that property. And whether that's a planning matter or not, I think we have to take it into consideration when we're making these decisions. Thank you. Councillor Crump. I'm happy to second the objection and propose we go to the vote. Right. Okay. Before we go to the vote, I'll take you as seconding the proposal made by Councillor Fielding earlier. I'd like to just sort of establish the reasons. I know it's been a good discussion. We've gone round and round. I think we've mentioned lots of really good reasons. I think we all agree that we don't like this, and that's we've got that far. 
for me, I, I want to sort of nail down our, our reasons for refusal, if that's okay. I'm, I'm looking over your notes. I think, Councillor Crump, you did a great job in looking through the policy numbers. And I think if we sort of start with those, could you, are you comfortable with those, Dale? Do you think they're adequate grounds for refusal? Can you run through them for us? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, if I can second what you've just said, <laughs> um, I do need some, some help and guidance to form planning reasons from the things that, you, you, that we've heard. The ward um, member gave you some. If, if I can leap instantly to CS15, can I caution against CS15? Um, I, I won't be cautioning against any of the other policies, but CS15 is, is a policy that's, that's looking at the distribution of development across the district. Uh, and the section that was specifically quoted was all development at existing settlements is expected to, and then it goes on. And the crucial part of that, of course, is existing settlements. It's not development at an existing settlement, and therefore I think perhaps that's not a helpful sentence to look at. Um, but the, certainly the other sentences you were looking at, the uh, CS9, CS9 AS10. Uh, yeah, again, could you, do you think, guide me a little bit on CS9? and a which particular point. parts, because it's quite a lengthy policy, which particular Could parts I? of CS9 you think we're not, we're not quite reaching. Can I go? Um, Councillor Crump, can and you? And the other one was AS10 and sustainable development, which I think does probably stand on its own feet. Councillor Crump, you you're seem to be on the page. I'm just going to catch up yeah, while you're so, talking. Yeah, page 22. Um, come. Let's see, I've got my other bits as well somewhere. Um, yeah. I know that um, we've also potentially um, CS24 as well, is that the landscape as well, what we're on the boat with our numbers on the policies. Um, I think we're, you know, we're basically saying that there is a distinct area there, the, the character and the space and the openness of the area um, is tending to be quite dramatic here, urbanised, if you, I don't know that's quite the right phrase, but bearing in mind it's a rural agricultural area, um, and then we're plonking... Impact on the setting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we're plonking the two rural cars. Setting. Yeah, up, so if we're looking at CS9... It's point two uh, in terms of the sensitive nature of this. So I think we're talking about the impact it's going to have on the landscape and the character of the, yep. of the site. So uh, that, I th give me two seconds. I'm just finishing the paragraph. So it's including the landscape features. So in terms, yeah, so for me, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, we believe that this is going to change the character and the nature of the setting, in that it's going to change it from being effectively a dish, well, a gosh, it sounds bad, a dead end of a lane, which doesn't see much traffic, doesn't see much move, vehicle movement, and it's going to change that considerably is what we're saying, and that will, of course, change the character and setting of the, of the area. So that's where we're coming from with CS9. Yeah, happy with that. Okay, let me find AS10. Let me see if I can find it. Where are I looking up? Where are we? Do you know the fact where you're out this fast? Me? Go on, tell me where it is. <laughs> Sorry. Lovely. Right, so, and in terms of this one, let me just rifle through this quickly, prepare the earlier. Say again. Go on, Councillor John. On, on AS10, it just says minimise impact on the occupiers and users of existing properties in the area. Well, it's going to have a massive impact on them. On AS10, the second point down. Would that be relevant? Thank you. Yes, there you go. You got there faster than me. Yep. So we're, we're concerned that it would have an, an, um, an unacceptable impact on the uh, existing properties in the area as a, res as a result of actually the next point down, which is the increase of traffic as well. Are we happy with the increase of traffic? Because I think that one's crucial. I think that's make sure. I'd like to make sure we've got as much as we can on this to make sure we're happy. I think... Uh, in terms of sustainability, don't we? I think we run into a bit of a problem in terms of the holiday let status, don't we? Because, of course, the holiday lets don't have the same level of requirement in terms of sustainability. I know we've made very good points about that, 
but we've got to stick to what we've got in our core strategy in terms of sustainability. A holiday let is more sustainable in this case, isn't it? Two seconds. Uh, two, three, four. Sorry to interrupt, Chair. Go for it. Am I, am I right in understanding here that we're going for the second and third bullet points of AS10? That's minimising the impact on the occupiers and, and to avoid the existing. Increase. And, and to avoid, avoid the increased level of traffic. traffic. Yep. That's it. Thank yep. you. Good. Yep. Thank you. I think you're going there. The next, so we're looking at the and so in terms of policy, perhaps CS24. I don't know if you've got the copies in the front of you. But this be uh, the nature of the activity, whether it can be reasonably located in a rural area. So we're not convinced that this can be located in a rural area. No, well, not this rural anyway. Um, impact on the character again of the local landscape. So that backs up where we were with the other policy and uh, the impact of the character on the local landscape and the nature of the relationship of the area. Okay, yeah. so there'll be points one, two, and three on that one. Thank you. Excellent. Thank right. you, Chair. Uh, sorry. So, to, yeah. Just to, you, Go you through came it, to me. Yeah. Just to confirm, on that basis, I think we can prepare a reason for refusal for okay. your agreement, Chair, tomorrow, okay. if, if that's where you want us to go. Okay, Committee, thank you for bearing with us. Um, our original proposal was from Councillor Fielding. Are you content with the reasons that we've put forward? Fantastic. And Councillor Crump, you're content as well as the seconder? I think you seconded. Okay. Right. It's been proposed and seconded that we refuse for the reasons stated. All those in favour of refusal, please, please show. Unanimous, oh, That was excellent. Well done. Thank you, everybody. Right. So, um, the committee therefore resolves to refuse application reference 17 slash 00632 slash FUL. Um, there we go. We can move to our next application, which is item 5. <coughs> Uh, okay, so this is application reference 17 slash 02544 slash FUL. This is Jaguar Land Rover, uh, Gaydon Test Centre, Banbury, Ga uh, Banbury Road, Gaydon. And it's for the demolition of an existing store building and the construction of an extension to the Southern Design Studio to the south of the GDC, uh, together with all the associated works. Uh, presenting officer is uh, Neil Hempstead. Neil, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. The um, application site is, is shown on the screen and is within the built form of uh, the Jaguar Land Rover site. So I've got some photographs which will give some, some context, but that's the existing main sort of G-Deck building and the design studio extension will be just there on the, the black line. Probably another point of reference is the British Motor Museum just there. So members, ju just giving a bit of context, members will, will recall the, um, the permissions that were granted last year uh, for the Jaguar Land Rover site, which is the, primarily the Gaydon Triangle site there and the Noise Vibration Harshness Building. Um, there's a, a, an, an entrance point going in here with associated parking and, and a lake, and uh, members may, may have noticed that work is progressing well on site at, at the moment. So just to give some context in terms of an aerial photo, this is uh, the GDEC building here. So the design studio is this element here, the storage building is just along here, and there is an existing bund which I'll point out in some, some other photographs. It's probably worth pointing out the, um, the existing building there. You can see it's significant in, in height, and I'll be referring to that later on. So I'll just show you a photograph looking along the back here. So there are some existing works uh, taking place to, to realign the access road and do some works to the existing bund, which has uh, been granted separate planning permission. So this is the, um, the building in question, storage building, which is to be, to be demolished. And then just looking there, there's the bund so you can see how that's being reprofiled with a fence and there'll be some, some planting on there. And that will uh, enhance the screening of the, the proposed building, the extension. So looking south, so that's the existing building at the moment. That's the existing storage there. And a proposed two-store extension is to go in there with um, associated plant on top. 
So looking uh, west, this is the, the view that I just showed you in the photograph. So that's the existing building to, uh, to be removed. And you can see the, the, the bun there. And again, the two-story extension going in there and the reprofiling which is, which is currently taking place. And looking east, again, the bund, you can see the reprofiling and the, the two-story extension which is, which is proposed to take place. So looking at existing and proposed ground floor plans, that's the existing storage area. So you can see how the extension will give um, significantly more, more floor space. And that's uh, demonstrated by the provision at first floor level. Chairman, there is one update as detailed in the update sheet, which is a further comment from, from Councillor Harris, uh, which is of no comment at this time. And Chairman, the recommendation is to grant plan information with the conditions and notes as detailed in the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Can I just quickly confirm this is purely here is size of development. That's the reason for referral to committee. That's correct. Thank you. Um, okay, should we go to our first registered speaker, Mr. Horrell, please, from uh, Pegasus, the applicant's agent. Right. Welcome. You have uh, three minutes. Uh, if you'd remain seated at the end for any questions. And I'll give you a warning at the last 10 seconds, if that's okay. Brilliant. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. My name is Owen Horrell, and I'm here as the agent for the planning application, um, representing Jaguar Land Rover. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the invitation of the chair shortly. Um, as introduced by your officer, the application seeks approval for the third and final phase um, of the reconfiguration of the Southern Design Studio. The application um, before you tonight follows and is consistent with other recently approved applications at Jaguar Land Rover on the Gaydon site. This includes the relocation of the service roads um, and the design hub um, to the north of the site, as, as indicated in the photos. The application is made so that Jaguar Land Rover can continue to provide, or can provide rather, replacement office space and associated facilities for its existing work workforce to enable the expansion of the realisation studio into the current office space. The proposals ensure that the workspace available to the existing staff are of a high quality and provide the facilities needed to keep the company at the forefront of their business. The proposals have taken into account or taken into full consideration highways, visual impact and landscape matters and concluded that the limited impacts are acceptable in planning terms. At 9.7 metres, the two-storey building is no higher than other parts of GDEC and comparable to that under construction in the DMO building to the east. In the context of the existing built and immediate surroundings to the development site, this is a minor extension, especially when considered in the setting of the overall Gaydon sites. The development proposed would sit comfortably within the Jaguar Land Rover site at Gaydon, being screened from views by the British Motor Museum, existing earth bands and existing vegetation. The proposals are in accordance with the national policy contained in the MPPF and local policy by virtue of policy AS11, and which support the operation of the site together with other benefits to Jaguar Land Rover weighing in the application's favour. We would therefore support the officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you, Mr. Horrell. Any questions, please? Yes, Councillor Crump. Just a very quick one, Mr. Horrell. Um, obviously, very little objections or representations. Um, on page 34 of the report, Bishop Sitchins and Parish Council um, would like to see more planting and landscaping. I just wondered whether that could be potentially accommodated. So within the footprint of the building itself, um, there's limited, or limited room for planting. Um, but as the committee will recall from previous applications, there is um, extensive landscaping proposed, as shown on the slide there, um, ecological enhancement area one and ecological enhancement area two um, that are between the application site and the parish, or the village of Gaydon, um, that provide some screening as a, as a separation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fielding. What... Um Courses you're taking because my ward um, includes Edge Hill and we can look across to the somewhat unsightly buildings that you've got over there which thank God trees are starting to grow up but I'm concerned because you've had this car park put in with high light, lighting and just trying to stop too much um, light too many sort of lighting in the area too much lighting up in the area what precautions are you taking with regards to that matter? 
Um, so specifically in respect of external lighting, there is no external lighting on the Seven Design Studio building here, and um, so there will be no, no additional impacts in that respect. Okay. Right. Councillor O'Donnell. Good evening. Um, just going back, actually, to Councillor Crump's point um, with Bishop Itchington Parish Council, they must obviously feel that there's a requirement for some more planting and landscaping. What is the facility for that with this particular application? Did you say it wasn't viable? Um, so in this particular application, there is no landscaping proposed directly, given the footprint size, but there is other applications that have been approved by this committee previously that include landscaping, um, which will reduce any impact this application would have. And to your knowledge, is that um, level of landscaping in keeping with the um, request of the Parish Council? Uh, I, would, I would be able to do so, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. If there are no further questions, Mr. Horrell, thank you very much. And we go to our ward member, Councillor Kettle. You could be making, they're playing musical chairs a little bit with these next two applications. So you have five minutes. Don't feel you have to use them all. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is great having Jaguar Land Rover applications because um, we have a centre of excellence here and something that we, I'm sure, and in my ward, we want to encourage. And this is part of their overall plan. And I know Neil has worked very hard on many, many applications here, so congratulations to Neil for move, moving this policy forward. Um, I have no objections to this. Um, I'd like to see it go forward. I have two concerns which are not listed in conditions. One is just to ensure the materials, this is pick, picking up Council Fielding's comment about the view from further distances, and in fact, both the Burton Hills and Edge Hill do look down on this, as does Idlicott uh, and um, what's the other hill called um, behind Ilmington. You all look down on it. Could we um, possibly put a condition on just so the materials should not be highly reflective on the surface, so that there is minimal reflective impact? Um, an awful lot of buildings do not have that, but some of the earlier buildings did. And I think we should follow the modern policy rather than the earlier policy on that. Um, and in terms of the planting issues, which um, uh, Bishop and Parish Council picked up, um, yes, there have been planting schemes in relation to earlier applications, um, but there's always been a slight concern as to whether enough has been done. Uh, and I would very much like to reiterate Bishop Itchington Parish Council's concerns here. Um, that if there could be any enhancement, there's none proposed here, to the previously approved schemes. I don't know whether that's possible, Neil. Um, but we have lost bonds in the past in relation to earlier applications. Um, this, this has no ecological impact on its own, in its own right. And I'm fully aware that there is a conservation, conservation area being developed between, immediately between Jaguar Land Rover and the northern parts of Gaden Village. However, that does not address the views as you're approaching Gaden from the Kyneton direction, past Chadson, for those of you who know the road, as you look right, particularly at night, it is a very visible site, and some of the foliage that is there currently is reaching the end of its sell-by date. Anything that we can do to enhance that natural screening that is in existence today will be much appreciated, even though it's coming through bishops rather than through Gaiden on this occasion. But in principle, chaps, I have no and ladies, well, I have no concern whatsoever about this application, and I think I'd be very grateful if you would support it. Thank you, Councillor Kettle. Any questions for the ward member? No. Thank you. Okay. Points. No, no, not yet. We'll Rush through. Um, points of clarification. Anybody? Questions? Right, should we go to the debate? Oh, Councillor Donald. Um, I remember when the um, previous application came up and Bishop Sitchington mentioned about the planting and landscaping. I did ask about it, but because I was new, I didn't realise you could put it down as a condition. Is it possible to backtrack, as Councillor Kettle has suggested? Is that something that can be done in keeping I'll, with his request? I'll throw this over to Neil. Um, not on this specific. In terms of the previous approval on the site and effectively the master plan on the site, if I can just zoom in slightly, I can. 
So, effectively, the application site is, is going in there. So there's various elements of landscape in there. There's the bund, which I showed you in the photographs, which will, which will add some, some screening, and that's being reprofiled and worked up at the moment. There is, um, if you can see this, this is a, um, an ecology area which was granted. Now, this, is consist, this consists of a series of, of buns up to, if memory serves you right, between about five and six metres high with planting on top. Um, and effectively, that is to provide a compensation area to the works which were undertaken on this site. Um, now, that is a significant size, and with the, uh, the contours and the planting attached, we'll add significant amount of screening. To, to this site. In addition to that, there is a landscaping buffer going along there as well. There is an existing landscape buffer there, and that is to reinforce that. Now, um, I absolutely understand Councillor Kettle's concerns, and I have discussed that with, with Jaguar Land Rover. And details have to be agreed in respect of that landscaping, so that's something that we can, we can take on board in respect to that. So in terms of an approach to landscaping and in the context of this, this application, an officer's opinion would be that there is a, you know, a significant amount going, going in and probably an appropriate amount for that, for that particular development. There was the other question, of course, about the materials in terms of reflective materials. Would that be something we could condition as well? To, or is it more of an... I, mean, I don't think it's conditioned. Would it be more of a note that we could add that would be more of a request to yeah. ensure that these are not the, highly reflective? The, the, the materials um, are, are consistent with the, with, the, with the palette which is being developed for, for the site to develop a, a consistent overall, overall approach. Um, the, the plans are to be conditioned, which will, con which will refer to the materials. Um, if members felt a note was appropriate, we, that, that, could be, that could be added. Right, that's fair enough. Thank you, Neil. Should we go to the debate? Councillor Mills. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I mean, I, since I've been a councillor since 2007 and seen the improvements that have gone on at Jaguar Land Rover, and they've always been pretty good. Okay, nothing's perfect, no, but, but by and large, I think they've done a good job up there. Um, as Councillor Kettle said, they're the centre of excellence, and uh, I, I think they're a credit to the area. And uh, I propose that uh, we accept this uh, officer's recommendation, Mr Chairman. Councillor Barnes, to speak. It doesn't quite happen to be second. I'm very pleased to see the parish council here, aren't here, sort of, having concern if there is any lights, it's all on that road that the county council put in. Well, laugh as you do, but that, that's the worst thing, so I'm only happy, too happy to say. Thank you. So, it's been proposed and seconded. Does anybody else want to speak on this before? Councillor, yes, Councillor Fielding. I'm fully supportive of it. Can you put your mic on? I'm fully supportive of it. The only thing that concerns me is light pollution, because we can, it, there's so much light coming from that area that we, you know, the more we can limit it or the more we can turn it down, the better. I think it's a fair point, but it's not something that would apply to this application, I think. You call, it's a fair one, though. Uh, I, think, I don't think we have anything else to say. I think it would be nice to see more landscaping in future developments and uh, perhaps more of an awareness for uh, JLR to be thinking about that in future. Um, but for this one, I'm quite content with what's been said. Should we go to the vote? Or, I mean, if, if everyone's happy with that. Sure, sure. Does anybody want the note regarding the non-reflective? I, I was just asking the question. I'm not convinced it's necessary. I think most of these re uh, re um, requirements are met already. If I can just comment yeah. on that, I think it's important that the buildings have an element of continuity. And if you start changing the fabric and the materials for one element, then it's... And I think uh, that you're right. I think Councillor Kettle alluded to the fact that actually more modern, the modern parts of the development have actually been much better, haven't they? So it's the older elements that were reflected. So I think you're right, but I think that probably has been taken care of already. So no. We'll be consistent. <laughs> That's exactly, it'll be consistent. We'll be consistent. Right. All those in favour of the application, uh, please show. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you.
The committee therefore resolves to grant 17-02544-FUL uh, and deja vu-like 17-2-2005-4-4-F-U-L-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R
No, in that case, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cattle, your turn. Over to you. Do so, Mr Chairman. <laughs> no, I support this. I mean, uh, I would just like to make sure that there is no, going to be no uh, lighting on top of this building, because clearly it is going up another story in, con in connection with um, Councillor Fielding's earlier comments. But no, no, um, no concerns with this at all. Um, of course, if the council was to decide that a little additional planting would be additional, that would be perfect. But thank you. I shall keep your timetable while we're shutting up now. Thank you. Any questions for the ward member? Never no. heard him so quiet. Oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Goodness, no. It's okay. Thank you, Councillor Kettle. Uh, points of clarification on this one, any at all? I'll just ask you to, ver to confirm there's, not, there's no additional lighting as part of this application. No, no, okay. there isn't. Thank you. Debate? Councillor Mills? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think we can do anything to hinder this, this um, the forward march of, 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 um, of JLR. I mean, they, you know, if, if we said no to this, it, you know, we're stopping people working, you know, and people, they're employing all the time, which is great news. So I would say I support the office recommendation, Mr Chairman, and I propose that as a proposal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perry, is that a second? I'd like to second Councillor Mill's proposal. Thank you. Um, should we go to the vote? All those in favour, please show. Yeah, the committee therefore resolves to cram to application reference 17 slash 027 57 slash FUL uh, on to item 7. Now then, this is the one I think we say goodbye to Councillor Mills for a bit. Okay. Um, no. Can you do this one more? If we can just do one more, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be useful. It's okay. Um, right. So, this is on page 57, it's application reference 17 slash 01569 slash FUL. Uh, this is for the land adjoining one house to the green, Little Kyneton, and the description of proposal is then for full application for the erection of five dwellings with access from Bridge Road, including all ancillary and enabling works. Um, presenting officer David Jeffrey. David, over to you. Thank you, Chair. As you correctly stated, this is application 1701569FUL. It's the erection of five dwellings on land adjoining one at House Little Kyneton. Um, members who were here at the last East Planning Committee may be sensing some deja vu. This is the other side of the site we considered at Little Kyneton in that committee. Um, we looked at application 1701436 REM that time, which was a reserve matters proposal, um, which was resolved to grant subject to section 106 for nine dwellings on uh, an adjoining part of the site. And I'll be referring to that as we um, proceed through the presentation. <clears throat> so this is the application site um, outlined in red. It's adjacent to the conservation area, which is outlined here in um, pink. Listed buildings um, shown as red filled in on there. <coughs> Members will note that the site is abutted by a public right of way in the green hatched line. This aerial view um, shows the site as an open paddock on the edge of the village. Um, Little Kyneton's extensive network of uh, greens shown here. This is Walnut House. This is the site we're concerned with today. And there's the neighbouring site which has an approval for nine dwellings. This is an excerpt from the Kyneton Neighbourhood Development Plan. It is adopted, so it sits alongside our core strategy um, as part of the development plan for this area. At policy um, SSB4, all of this land outlined red here is allocated for the development of approximately 10 dwellings. This plan shows the proposed development of five dwellings outlined in red. 
Also adjacent land, which is outlined in green, is the aforementioned approval for nine dwellings. The land within blue is uh, within the applicant's ownership also. This photo shows the point of access from Bridge Road. Um, members will note the uh, dry stone or uh, rubble wall that will be the point of access into the field on the right. The gable building there is garage and then there are houses facing onto uh, the greens at Little Kyneton. The trees um, along the boundary wall will be retained and the intention from the plan is to bend this uh, wall into the development so it will form a boundary within the scheme. This is the opposing view looking west along Bridge Road. The access being in this area here, the approximate point of the sign notice. This is a photo showing the view from within the green at Little Kyneton, again looking towards the um, proposed access. Those buildings that we saw the gable end of here, the access will be here. Um, Members will know the views from within Little Kyneton Conservation Area and entering the village were referred to in the case officer's report. This is the view from within the site. Um, looking at Walnut House itself there, boundary trees on either side and this wall here and the hedge and uh, trees will form the boundary near the access of Bridge Road. Looking to the left, you can see the boundary um, of the western side. The strong tree-lined hedge, the neighbouring field, actually incorporates um, a significant stand of trees um, much of the time. Just drop out of this presentation now and have a look at a video from within the site. Sorry, it's not from within the site. This is from Bridge Road, showing the um, boundary wall, the op opposite paddock. From within the site, now looking at the um, western boundary, looking across towards Bridge Road. And then the last video, again from within the site, next to the actual walnut tree, which would be retained. Here we see the um, western boundary of the site, tree-lined um, on our left-hand side. The boundary wall and the tree-lined boundary of Bridge Road. The walnut house itself and the tree line boundary with Walnut House. Moving across here, we're looking now towards the neighbouring development, this land that has uh, been tended to in a diff different fashion, um, is in a different ownership and is the land which would be um, the nine dwellings access off Tyso Road for that. The boundary between the two developments would be the public right of way. This is the property which neighbours the nine dwelling development on Tyso Road. The public right of way leaves the site in this location and continues along field boundaries um, in a westward direction. Finally returning to the original view of the walnut tree. The application proposal uh, sees five dwellings arranged around a cul-de-sac. Um, members will note that plot one faces out onto Bridge Road. 
the boundary wall of Bridge Road being turned into the site as a, a feature. Through um, negotiation with the applicant, improvements to the scheme have been made in the form of a link to the neighbouring uh, public right-of-way. That public right-of-way will be improved by the scheme adjacent. And additional tree planting on the western boundary uh, to try and satisfy the requirements of neighbourhood planning policy SSB4 um, have also been incorporated within the garden areas. Elevation, <coughs> excuse me. Elevations are shown here for the different plots. These to be completed in uh, a natural stone and featuring uh, a glazed element to plot for. Chair, that concludes the presentation. Um, there are no updates in the update sheet. Uh, the recommendation is to grant subject to the conditions and notes in the agenda. Thank you, David. Um, excellent. Let's go to our first speaker there. I've got David Gosling, Chairman of the Parish Council, and Ken Priddis as well. If you'd like to come up, please. <coughs> yeah, it is actually. It's just the unfinished business evening, I think. Okay. Um, Councillor Gosling, I presume you're going to start, are you? How are you going to split this time between you? Are you going to be doing most of the talking or...? Um, if it's okay with the council, I should do all the talking and then and then council the is here for any questions. questions. Perfect. In that case, you have three minutes. You know the routine. Okay. Over to you. If I could just do a council and kettle and get my stopwatch going, that would be a great help. Perfect. Thank you. Councillors, good evening. The decision that you're taking tonight will have major repercussions, not just in Kyneton, not just in the east area of the Stratford district. Um, this is a test case for most, if not all, neighbourhood development plans. You're being asked to consider whether a neighbourhood plan should be given less weight than the core strategy or the national planning policy framework. Uh, neither the NPPF nor the core strategy were voted on by the electorate. This is a different document and we're confident that the government never intended the NDPs to be ignored and interpreted in the manner before you. If you agree with the officer, you'll be sending a message to all those who toiled to develop their plans, such as Welford, that they wasted hours and hours of their time. And it will also raise the question of why bother to those finishing off their plans, such as Wellsbourne. You will also be giving a green light to developers, inviting them to look again and see where allocated sites can be considered fair game for a 40% increase in the housing numbers determined by plan. This is not an attempt to cap, but to set agreeable tolerances. We don't believe that you should allow this to happen, and neither does our MP, Jeremy Wright. The officer is attempting to justify the numbers in the application in front of you by including another site that is pending consideration. As we all know, even after planning consent is granted, a developer can return and apply to increase the numbers proposed, and generally this gets permitted without debate. So please do not accept the erroneous aggregation argument when forming your opinion. You must look at this application for what it is, an attempt to increase the proposed housing by 40% more than allocated in a plan. The officer's report invites you to balance the harm, which is identified as views from the conservation area, against the public benefit as you consider your decision this evening. This harm, and I quote from the report, is coarsening the current gentle transition from the historic conservation area context, replacing it with a substantive modern housing development. The benefit is, frankly, nothing. There is no community gain, no public open space, no children's play area, no allotments, no affordable housing. This is unnecessary additional housing at a location determined as sustainable, but for a much lower number. Kyneton already has 15% more new housing than required under the core strategy, either in construction or with planning approval. So it's not a numbers game. This is housing of an unnecessary size and of ill-defined material. Harm is identified, and I would remind you of the potential harm caused by ignoring a neighbourhood plan. Benefits, there are none. If this application is granted, it will Ten fly seconds. in the face of localism. I urge you to reject it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Can I kick off with one quick question? I'm going to come straight to the parish plan, so it's probably a council for you, uh, question for you, Councillor Prittis. Um, can you confirm, because I wasn't at the last uh, meeting, so we're talking about the total site here, which is sort of this L shape, I'm guessing, um, and in your Clinton Parish Plan, which is fully adopted, how many houses, and what was the precise wording that you used to describe that? What were you, what were you um, in your neighbourhood plan suggesting? The neighbourhood plan refers to the number as being approximately 10. Thank you. Okay. And this, of course, would bring that site in total up to exactly 14. Correct. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we'd establish that point. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Parry. Good evening, Councillor Goslin. Um, it might be a query for Councillor Priddis. Um, it is in respect of your neighbourhood plan in terms of the type of housing in terms of size, bedroom size and that sort of thing, um, did you did your research and did you have a policy in terms of the type of housing that will be required for Little Kyneton as opposed to Big Kyneton? I mean, it's well, it's not Big Kyneton, it's Kyneton. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, We've looked at sites and we've looked at the type of housing that would be required within the total Kyneton district. We feel that this development, apart from going well over the numbers, 40% more than was allocated in the neighbourhood plan, would also provide housing which was unnecessary. We've had other sites where four and five bedroom houses have been proposed by developers. They found it difficult to market them and eventually they've come back and said, no, we can't sell four and five bedroom houses, we'll reduce it to three, but increase the number. This occurred on a previous site within Kyneton. So this could easily occur on this, okay? But our major concern, I would stress, is the fact that this is a 40% increase on the actual site allocation as voted by the people of Kyneton. Thank you. May I just supplement that? In the neighbourhood plan, there were policies that refer to housing mix. Um, it refers to obviously complying with the core strategy housing mix, but that can only be triggered by sites that are more than 10 in number. And therefore, this site, as with obviously. the attached site. That's okay. That's Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Yes, could I just have this clarification of 40%? Is this 40% over the quota that is a minimum quota for the village, or 40% over what the plan, your plan, had got down. Do you understand um, where I'm coming from? No, no, no thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, the plan as voted upon by the, the, the population of Kyneton stated approximately 10. Nine have already been granted on this site, plus this additional five, make 14. So we're saying the 14 Four percent, four houses more than the ten, forty percent extra. Okay. For the site. Councillor Fielding. You refer to in your when, what you're saying, that there was another site close by you think that is more in keeping with the um, neighbourhood plan. How far away is that? Um, sorry, if the officer could put up a and show you. Um, it is to the um, exact opposite side of um, which are you referring to the nine or are you referring to a completely additional? Well, we, we granted the green one last time. Yes, we granted I got one. the indication that there was another site close by that may come forward. Uh, there is one under consideration. It hasn't been determined yet. It is the other side of Little Kyneton be between the Sports and Social Club and Sycamore Court. That but it doesn't form part of this application, so we'll have to move beyond it. I mean, that is a, that's okay. For your own understanding, that's fine. But it's not part of it. It's okay. We'll have to move on. I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor, nobody else? No, I'm sorry, because it's not part of this application. So I've allowed the question. I think we've got the, the gist of the answer, but I can't allow us to go any I further. I agree it's not part of the application. Then that's the excellent. Thank you. It. Okay. So, um, brilliant. If, are there any other questions to the Parish Council? In that case, gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm sorry I can't let you go on. Thank you. Right, okay. Um, we now go to the um, applicant's agent. Uh, Mr. Steve Taylor, please. Welcome, Mr. Taylor. Evening, so, everyone. You've, I think, been here before, so you know the routine. I do, yes. Okay, so you have three minutes. Thank you very Over much. to you. 
Right. With the greatest of respect to the Parish Council, their objection is fundamentally illogical. And, frankly, it's inconsistent with their approach on other sites in Little Kyneton. There are two allocated sites in the neighbourhood plan, Site A and Site B. And I, I, the reason I say it's illogical is that both have been allocated for approximately 10 dwellings. But one site is twice as large as the other. So it is illogical to expect the same number of buildings on each site. Um, on the site to the north, the Parish Council are supporting eight dwellings, uh, which is an undersupply on approximately 10. The total number of dwellings proposed for Little Kyneton is 20. Now, if this application is approved, this will bring the total, including um, the, the site in green that was approved three weeks ago, to 22, which in my book is approximately 20. So, um, uh, we, when the, their objection to this, I've been baffled by it from day one, and we have made every attempt to try and take on board their objections. We have uh, made changes to the site, um, and we have uh, consulted with the chief um, policy officer at the district council, and in an email to me, or to the officer, he said, from a planning policy point of view, I do not consider there is a conflict with the neighbourhood plan. Uh, that is from your highest officer. Now, um, in every other respect, this application is totally policy compliant. Um, we're not building five hideous houses here. We're building a superb development of five large family houses with a range of uh, bedrooms from three to five dwellings, which again is policy compliant with uh, CS18. Although we're under no, because of the, it's only five dwellings, we're not under obligation to comply with that policy, but we do anyway. Uh, there are no objections at all from the public, and there are no objections from any other statutory consultee. Um, the application is sustainably located, uh, with well connected to the public footpath that divides the two halves of the site, which will allow children who move into this development to walk to Kyneton High School or cycle there. Um, I've referenced in the report questions from the neighbourhood plan examiner who clearly suggested that caps should not be imposed on the allocated site as this is contrary to the MPPF in principle. Ten seconds. This approach uh, to numbers was, was recently upheld in appeal in Councillor Bard's ward um, for the... Um, core strategy generally, but this applies specifically to this neighbourhood plan. Thank you. Thank you. Run out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, any questions, please? Councillor Parry. Good evening, Mr Taylor. Can you just um, advise um, the process of consultation with the Parish Council over this particular site? Yes, it was, it was um, an initially put in, uh, and there was no direct connection to the public footpath that bisects the site from the green one that you approved three weeks ago and this one. Um, so we um, adjusted that so that there was a, a link to that public footpath, which is three metres wide and naturally bisects the site into two halves. Uh, but also they were concerned about the um, stand of trees on the left-hand side of that plan, over which we have no control. So we additionally planted all the way down the left-hand side trees that are in our control so that if the neighbouring landowner decided to cut all these trees down we would still have you know, a substantial um, planted boundary along that boundary. Um, and again, we, we try to address any other points that they raised in terms of effect on listed buildings and so forth and so on. Um, and that was covered really by the fact that the conservation architect raised no objection to our scheme. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, Councillor Barnes. I'm not sure my question has been answered, but you have had quite a, con a number of meetings with the Parish Council. Yes. Well, certainly the, the, the applicant has, and I've responded in writing to any points that they've raised during the process on two occasions. Okay. Right. Um, any other questions at all? Mr. Taylor, thank you very much. Then. Should we go to our ward member, Councillor Mills, if you're ready to step up? <clears throat> uh, 
Councillor Miller, I'm going to ask you to make yourself comfortable for a second. I'm just going to delay us for a moment. Councillor Mills, I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting. We're ready to move on to you now. Thanks, so okay. too. Thank you. You have five minutes. <clears throat> Over to you. Now, good evening, councillors. Um, I'm very concerned by this application, the officer's recommendation and the interpretation of the kind of neighbourhood development plan. I will try to identif identif identify each of my concerns. And uh, as far as I know, one of the things is that there was no consultation with the parish council. It is wrong to include two other sites in Little Kyneton as part of the justification for this one. One of these sites does not have approval, neither of them are built out. Nothing stops either of them from returning with the revised application to increase housing numbers on each. It is wrong to compare the density of a build on another site with this one. The two sites are distance apart and this is the furthest from the centre of Kyneton. The, the sustainability of each location must be taken into account. I would remind you that Little Kyneton is re referenced in the core strategy as a local service village and scored at a level which considers it too small to support any new housing unless brought forward in a neighbourhood plan. The Kyneton neighbourhood plan assessed the sustainability and determined ten houses on this site, nine of which have, been received, well, have received planning approval. The number 10 was not disputed by the planning department during the consultation period, so the number 10 should be accepted by us as the planning authority. It is wrong to say that the site is within the settlement boundary and therefore able to support housing as an infill. The site is on the very edge of the settlement boundary. This boundary was, redraw was redrawn with the intention of including the site for 10 homes. It is wrong to say that this application to increase the numbers on an allocated site by 40% is part of acceptable moderate growth. The Kyneton Neighbourhood Development Plan is already delivering 15% more than the numbers envisaged through the cost strategy and further development is anticipated. It is wrong to say that if one of the sites in Little Kyneton is being developed for fewer homes then the plan anticipated then this site can be soak up the sh shortfall. This site is considered sustainable for ten houses by the people who live here and who voted for the plan. A plan which, yes, in some policy provides, provides flexibility and scope for planning judgment. But when an allocated site is specified for a number, then it is not expected that, that the flexibility means 40%, that's 40% more, particularly if it impacts on sustainability. It is right that it will be some impact on the appearance of the part of the village. It is right that the views will be affected from the footpaths in the village green. It is right that you should decide whether that harm is outweighed by the public benefit. As a ward member, I can find little, if any, public benefit. What I can see is considerable harm to the democratic process. The report states that the officer considers the delivery of dwellings on an allocated housing site to be of notable benefit. It is not for the officers to ignore the Kyneton Neighbourhood Development Plan which allocated its site for a spe specific number and to declare any benefit by ignoring that plan and adding 40%, I'll repeat, 40% more dwellings. Lastly, it is wrong to claim that this application fulfils the vision of the Kyneton Neighbourhood Plan by securing appropriate developments and safeguarding against unplanned development which may arise if housing commitments are not met, met on an allocated site. This is not an appropriate development. Housing commitments are already met by the approved application for nine houses on this allocated site. To approve this will be to inflict unplanned development, not to safeguard against it. 
councillors. I cannot stress enough how important this decision about planning policy and planning principles. Should this application be granted, I do, not, I do know that there are other developers who are looking at other sites in Kyneton who would take advantage of this decision and use this as a precedent to suit their own ends. I was elected to represent my community, as you all were. I'm a strong believer in the principles of localism, and if this committee approves this application, you'll be jeopardising its ethos, and I believe undermining the legislation which enacted it. I, too, urge you to reject this application on the grounds of impact on the views from a conservation area, contrary to the Kyneton Neighbourhood Development Plan, overdevelopment of the site, and unless you think that a neighbourhood plan, the neighbourhood which has gone through a demetric process is worthless, then vote to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mills. Any questions for the ward member? Councillor Parry. Thank you, Councillor Mills. I just wonder whether you can advise, obviously the proposed development is being positioned as family homes. Can you advise how far is the nearest children's playing facility? Gosh, the nearest uh, children's playing facility um, would be uh, in a place called Park Peace, which is uh, in Kyneton, which I would say it's, it's approximately um, 900 metres away. And then there's another one which is further on, going out of Kyneton, which is um, uh, about a mile away. Going back to the uh, Kyneton neighbourhood plan, was there anything in the policy where you were looking at sites for new developments um, where there was a recommendation that a site, I mean obviously this site was, if I'm right in understanding what you said, was identified by the, the neighbourhood planners for ten dwellings, would you have imagined that there would have been a children's playing facility on, on the site? I'm, uh, not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not convinced. I don't think, I'm sorry, I don't think it's a question that's relevant to this application. It's more supposition really, isn't it? Speculating on what would have been nice, I think. We, we oh, have. Is, it, was, is there anything in the neighbourhood plan that's, that requests but, well, there it, sorry, play yeah. facilities with, with, settle, with proposals of this size on this site? No, I, I no. believe not. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Perry. Um, any other questions, please, to the ward member, Councillor Fielding? The referral to large five bedroom, four bedroom houses. Are there any other sites that you know or you can point where, we've, where there isn't the sales going through? Because it, it, it looks as if there's going to be too many in the, in the area. I've got to stop you. I, I mean, we've got to stick very closely to the application. We can't be wandering off onto other sites that we think are similar and, and things like that. So if you've got a question on this particular application, fine. But if not, I'll have to move on. I'll go to Councillor Barnes first, then come back if you like. Well, what I was going to ask was, this site was allocated for 10. It's got five big houses. Is that, if you like, the mix that is in the parish plan? Well, um, or is there no, we have a mix in our parish plan, but I didn't know whether you did. Um, we... Sorry. We ha no, uh, we... We've, as I think as mentioned by uh, Councillor Gosling in his um, submission, on other sites we've had uh, five-bedroom homes uh, put in, and because there are no takers of five-bedroom homes, so they reduce them, and of course they reduce them and put extra housing on. So the um, the, the need for five-bedroom homes is is very very small in that area. Okay, I think that's fine. Councillor Fielding. Do you want to come back then? You keep referring to the ten houses. Was that both plots, the one we gave permission to last time, plus this one, or is it just the, on this particular piece? Uh, originally, this um, was proposed on the site, the whole of that site. Um, that was in the neighbourhood plan. The whole of that site was, it was be for ten homes, um, but then part of it was sold off, and, of course, then the applicants come in to put another... Um, Four up. Five up, sorry. 
Thank you, Councillor. So he's, he's increased it by That's okay. 40%. Uh, any other questions? And it's not, can I? Sorry? Go on. I, I think and, you're moving and, away from the point no, of the question. And as has been said, this, um, it's approximately 10. To me, approximately 10 is either 9 or 11, not 14. All right, thank you. Okay, any further questions to the board member? All right, I think we'll move on. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Uh, points for clarification, anybody? Councillor Parry. Yes, uh, uh, the, the point for clarification I would welcome is um, an explanation why the um, officer doesn't view this or, or why this, uh, this particular application is being considered as a standalone site rather than an extension to the, the application, because the actual site, when the, if I'm right, the officer, when he presented the, the site, it was the whole of the red area of this site and the adjacent you, site, no? Are you talking about the allocation? Go on, show Was that the, from the site allocation? Us, it's just that there is an, what I'm just trying to, yes, that has been presented to us. Um, and I would just like clarification why the, the, the proposal site is not being considered as an extension to the, to, because to me it looks as though it's, the whole site was part of the site allocation and to me the, the, the application that's before us this evening doesn't strike me as a standalone site. David, do you have any? Go on, David. Yeah. The, this particular slide is an excerpt of the Kyneton Neighbourhood Development Plan that is SSB4 identified for approximately 10 dwellings. The site that we previously considered is this in green, um, where we approved an outline application in 2015 for nine dwellings with access off Tyso Road. Officers have considered them as um, two separate applications, really, um, as the sites are in different ownerships and will be accessed from different roads. Um, the authority considered and approved the development of Tyso Road separately, and that scheme meets its own requirements in terms of um, policy compliant housing mix and affordable housing. Um, accordingly, we reached the conclusion that the, the two sites should not be considered cohesively as part of this net new application and the Tyso Road site. Um, and on that basis, we proceeded with, with the application to this point. I think it's the, the best answer that can be given, really. I can understand why it's a difficult one to answer. Councillor Fielding, then Councillor Brain. Has there any archaeological survey been carried out, bearing in mind that Edge Hill was fought all, the Battle of Edge Hill was fought all the way up to here, and there's an old Mott and Bailey castle just round the corner? Have, have you inquired of the archaeological? This, which page is it? <coughs> I think that the answer is no, there hasn't been, um, as far as I'm aware, a archaeological investigation for this site as of yet. It is something that we could address. Well, it will be addressed as part uh, of the conditions, condition. I believe, won't it? Yeah. So one of the conditions, and this is just drawn my attention to, condition seven on page 70 of your agenda will require archaeological survey work to be done to undertake in prior to commencement of, the, uh, of building. Um, any, uh, Councillor Brain? Obviously the site in the neighbourhood development plan was acceptable, the whole site. But you used the word approximately 10. Is that the word in the neighbourhood development plan? Or is it your wording? Uh, it is the NDP, policy SSB for residential development for approximately 10 dwellings will only be permitted on this site. 
this, that that's the reason I asked the question yeah, of the parish council was as added. well. It's part of the neighbourhood plans wording. And yes. I, I might be pertinent to the question to say that that wording was added by the inspector prior to the referendum. Okay. okay. Councillor Crump. All right, David. Um, page 63. Um, obviously, we've touched on the two sites, saying approximately 10 on both, the 10 and 10 making 20. This one site, we're now up to potentially 14. Um, and then the other site has an application in which could have potentially eight. We usually compare or look at each site on its merit. And why I'm looking at it is that, yes, they potentially got a site in application of eight, um, but there's no guarantee that when it comes to committee, they would stick to the eight and they could potentially have 10 or potentially 12, because that's approximately 10 on the basis. Yeah, bear with me, sorry. Um, so in, if it came to it, if they put in 12, and we've got 14 here, We'd have 26 against, say, application of 20. So um, that would be significantly over. So I'm just, how, I'm just trying to find the link between the two sites, because we, we normally look at them on their own merits and on the application that we've got in front of us. And there's an element of doubt regarding the other site. Yeah, I think I understand where you're coming from. I think that the first thing to point out is just a point of clarification about the comments on page 63. They're not this officer's comments. They're comments from uh, the head of district council's policy uh, team. Um, I think what, what he's trying to describe here is that the NDP, the development plan as a whole, including our core strategy, need, needs to be read as a whole and that there is, within the documents, um, flexibility. I think it's clear that the inspector on these sites didn't know precisely, in design terms, what was going to be the correct number, and that this would emerge through um, development proposals coming forward. Um, you're absolutely right. Proposals may come forward down the line for a greater number of dwellings on these sites and we would need to consider those on their merits um, your investment can go up as well as down it's, there's, there's a possibility as well that fewer dwellings could be proposed or eventually delivered on any one of these sites because what we're talking about is commitments that have been made through planning permissions or proposals which are in the pipeline um, for both of these sites, none of them are um, on site delivering at the moment but what I think that the um, policy manager was trying to uh, elucidate on was really that this is a, a, a whole of plan assessment, that there is flexibility within the NDP sufficient to suggest that this proposal on its own does not conflict with that plan necessarily. Councillor Fielding. Just a quick one. The word stone, um, you are using local stone as opposed to mixed concrete stone. Excellent. Good question. Can we, because we were talking about this earlier, there's new plans for how this works, aren't there? So could you just talk us through that? So it would be for the applicant to propose the stone. The planning officers wouldn't, wouldn't be um, putting it forward. But in terms of our assessment, the expectation for a natural stone these days uh, is that it would go through our new process that uh, um, was just referred to. To, to get an approval of a, for a condition for a stone, it now needs to be consulted upon with the parish council so that they have opportunity to view a panel of that stone constructed on site uh, to satisfy themselves that it's appropriate in terms of texture, colour and um, finish. Excellent. Uh, should we go to the debate then, if we're finished on questions? Councillor Brain, then Councillor Barnes. Obviously, Chairman, it's a difficult one. Um, I think the problem I have is that the Neighbourhood Development Plan accepts the development site for building, and the inspector claims the issue would put in approximately 10. So it doesn't fix the figure at um, 
10, it can be more, it could be less. Um, reading the report, there are no objections from third parties. It's from the Parish Council and Ward member. Um, I can't find reasons for refusal, quite honestly. Um, so between a bit of a rock and a hard place, I'll listen to what my colleagues have to say. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Then. Yes, I'm, I'm very sorry for Kynton, really, because what has been mentioned, um, Long Marston is supposed to have 32, he's got 78, and Councillor Mills was here with the dog when we were told that the numbers 14,600, which we thought was a maximum, is the minimum. Um, so we are in a situation because this was in the parish plan, I appreciate that it's more than they wanted, um, but they did say they didn't want big houses. Well, if they had two bedroom houses, they'd have ten houses there. So uh, I think if we were to refuse it, we would have a job uh, at appeal. That's my personal opinion. I do feel sorry that we've got them, and Snitterfield now has had a, 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 another bombshell there. Uh, if you want to put it that way, too many, but that appears to be the way that um, the inspectors go in. And if we were to refuse it, I can't see us winning. Like Councillor Brain, I can't see any real reason that would hold up. Can, thank you, Councillor Parry. Thank you, Chair. I've got I've got major issues, I'm afraid, particularly as someone who's been involved in pulling together a neighbourhood plan. Um, obviously not Kyneton, um, because it does send a large message to all the, the steering groups putting neighbourhood plans together that basically are doing all this work on a voluntary basis to think, well, actually, what is the point? Why do we bother to do it? Um, this particular, if you take the whole of this site, to me, it's almost planning via stealth because there's no affordable housing because the site's been split. So they've got, they've got a situation here where there is no benefit in terms of affordable housing um, to, to the village. Um, I think it's a shame this one didn't come first before the previous one. Um, but I do have a problem because I do think it, you know, there are serious questions it sets in terms of the weight and, and the whole value behind neighbourhood plans. Um, and I have got big concerns about this as, as, a, as a planning principle because I think, you know, at the end of the day, Stratford District Council planning department spent weeks in fact, years guiding Kyneton through their neighbourhood plan. Hours and hours and hours. Then they actually ratify it and then take it out to consultation. And the first time on, you know, this is not the first time because the last time the, the other portion of the site we had problem in terms of its design and impact on character on Little Kyneton. And here we have another situation whereby, you know, it goes against the neighbourhood plan policy. And I'm just scratching my head and thinking, it's not surprising that other villagers who are putting together neighbourhood plans and the Secretary of State is encouraging people to do neighbourhood plans. What is the point? What is the point if you have a situation where they've identified sites, they've identified the type of housing that needs to be there, and we just disregard it. Councillor O'Donnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I completely support what Councillor Parry has said, and actually um, she said what I was just about to say. But I think we are setting a precedent, and I'm really concerned about this flexibility regarding numbers. Um, it's almost as if with our neighbourhood plans, which do take an inordinate amount of time, um, let's involve you but not empower you. We'll you know, put all your ideas down but we're not going to listen to a word of it. Um, and I'm really worried about the lack of weight we're giving to the um, NDP. And I do agree with Councillor Parry that there's something rather shady about this application because it is just a large application. The two sites, they're next door to each other. So you can't, I know they're putting separately but 
all they've done is avoid affordable housing and providing any um, facilities or, or resources for that community. So um, I'm not happy with the application and also the signal it sends out regarding your um, NDP because you are engaging communities and then not listening to them and that's I think a highly dangerous way to go. Thank you Councillor. Councillor Fielding. I, I'm of the same opinion. We've got the problem in Tyso where they're trying to do the development plan um, and it's causing all sorts of problems within the village and now seeing this which is again affecting the neighbourhood plan. I can see Tyso turning around saying forget it. Um, we've had the problem with stone in the village. We've had problems on planning sites there and I really feel that we've got to keep to the neighbourhood plan otherwise what the hell, what, sorry, what is the point? Anybody else want to speak in the debate? I'll add my thoughts at this point. Um, I've got the utmost respect for people who have taken part in these neighbourhood plans. As a ward member here, I've you know, encouraged people and you know, banged the drum for them and gone on and on about them over and over again, and I completely respect the amount of time and the amount of work that's gone into them. I'm also a big supporter of trying to, you know, of, 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 of testing them, of testing their strength, making sure they work, and we have done it on another application in, in, in Kyneton, I'm sure you'll be aware of it. However, for me, we're coming down to one particular phrase, and as a history teacher, every day I have to teach the meaning of the word interpretation, and in this case, we're going to interpret the word approximately. And that's what I'm sticking at. And if I was in a classroom and I was asking lots of people, what do you think of this word approximately, I would get 30 different answers from 30 different kids, because they would all have their own version of this. So I come down to what my interpretation of approximately is in this case. My personal feeling is this is approximately around 10. It is over. I get that. And do I have a concern about the way in which the site has been divided? Absolutely. Would I have preferred it to have been thought of as one application, come forward as one site? But if we're looking at the overall numbers for this site, and if it was to go to an appeal later, an inspector would look at all the sites in Little Kyneton, and he would no doubt draw a conclusion that it is approximately around the same number. And that's my feeling. But I fully accept that's my interpretation of this, and I'm sure everybody else will have different interpretations of the word approximately in this case. For me, I'm, I'm going to have to go with the officer's recommendation of Grant, because I feel this is approximately right. That's my thoughts. Are you proposing... I'm about to propose that, that's, uh, that we, that we uh, grant the application. I would need a seconder, but if you'd like to come in first, I'm more than happy. So can I just clarify, you're saying that 14 is approximately 10? Is that what you're suggesting? Just, just My interpretation is that okay. it's around that. I know it's a... It's, well, it's just a guess out of jail card, isn't it, for, any, for people to put through a greater number than the NDP actually wanted. Approximately is surely one above or one below, but that's my interpretation of it. Again, this is yeah. exactly where that's we're going to run into problems. That, I think that's too big a stretch for approximately four above, could, personally, well. but that's it's personal, yeah. You see, this okay. is the point, yes. and I, yes, I think but we're exactly... Yes, they're doing that with the, the inspectors. That's... But it's going to be a question of interpretation for everyone to make. And I think you could go four under, and nobody would be complaining. <laughs> but we're going four over, and yes, we're getting complaints. But I think in terms of this, it is... T I, could make, I could sit here and say, well, it would have been great if the people at the County Parish Plan had, had fought the inspector on the insertion of the word approximately. I'm sure you did, probably. But there we are. We are where we are on this. And my interpretation of this is that we're, it's around there. Right. My proposition here, then, is that we grant. Um, I'd need a seconder for that proposal. Otherwise, we'll have to come up with a different proposal. Councillor Barnes, do you second my proposal? Thank you. Go ahead. We're just going to check something.
Could we ask what's going on? Discussion. I'm going to have to share with you the discussion, the discussion about where the footpaths lead to. Um, could we just get you to indicate the footpaths that we're looking at, please, with the mouse, if that's possible? We're just discussing, and I'm, I'm aware that we've kept the public and the committee waiting while there's a bit of discussion going on, in terms of where these two footpaths connect up to, given they're both owned by different, well, they're both parts of different separate applications. And that's why we're just having a bit of back and forth here to make sure that the officers and Mesa are happy. So if you just permit us a couple of seconds longer. We're going to adjourn for five minutes. Apologies to everybody for this delay.
Right, okay, let's get back to it. Um, okay, we've had a brief discussion of footpaths. I'm going to start with Mesa, if that's okay. That's fine, Chair. Uh, right. If members could stay with me. The um, application to the right-hand side, which we, uh, the, well, the Council approved three weeks ago, uh, as part of that application, there is an application to divert the footpath. Now, the, uh, the application to actually divert that, the order has been made, but at the moment, that's as far as it's got. So it hasn't been confirmed, which it needs to be, and then after that, it needs to be certified. So, get my breath, sorry, coming down the stairs. So basically, at the moment, where you see the path on the map, that's not the legal line of the path. Where the legal line is at the moment is the red line, which has just been drawn by David or Dale. So basically, the footpath link from this application we're considering now will go into a field at the moment. It doesn't link to a footpath. Eventually, it will, once the works are done on the right-hand side, but at the moment, on the left-hand side, that footpath link will go to nowhere. So that is a slight issue. That's the issue I have with condition 17, is at the moment, basically, the owners on the left-hand side have no control over the owners on the right-hand side to make sure the owners on the right-hand side implement that footpath so they can link into it. And then Dale will come right. with Dale. some plan issues. No yes, thank you, Chair Mason. So the, the situation we're in at the moment is that we are being offered a plan that shows a footpath link that connects to the top corner of that field, but we can require it to go no further. There is every reason to expect that this site here will be developed in the way that you approved uh, at the last committee. If that doesn't go ahead for any reason, a larger plan. So, generally speaking, as best as I can draw it, that's the route of the footpath, yeah. as it is today. The route of the proposed footpath is this green dotted line here, and the proposal is to connect through to it like that. As you've heard from Mesa, that diversion is under process, it's underway. That diversion must take place in order for the nine houses that you approved at the last committee to be built and occupied. So there is reasonable confidence that that will happen. If for any reason the developer comes back with another application, obviously we would need to put the same requirements on a future application as we put on the previous one, that the footpath is diverted to follow that route. So the only possibility that this footpath wouldn't be delivered and wouldn't be available to the occupiers of this current application is if the site to the right, this site, is never developed. And it is possible that that will happen, but officers regard it as a very remote possibility. So the advice that officers are given, giving is that a footpath link can be provided, but it's with that caveat that if the, the development on this piece of land never takes place, it will not be possible, and we will expect an application to come in from the developer to vary the condition. Thank you, Chair. So, um, clarification. The, pla the plan we approved last time came up to the footpath. Is that correct? Or did it come up to the green line? The path you approved previously, Chair, came up to the green dotted line. Right, Councillor Barnes. So it involved relocating the footpath along well, the green dotted I line. I appreciated that I seconded the motion to move it forward. But uh, in my eyes, I, I, I feel more like we should defer until we get a, a proper legal thing because this footpath has come up at the last minute. It's, it, uh, it does need a footpath, but as far as I'm concerned, I'd be quite happy to propose deferral until well, it's sorted. Okay. <laughs> I've got, I'm, go on. I, say, I think Dale has explained it, that uh, basically if, if the um, footpath condition the path condition can't be Im implemented, then they will come back with another application. Chair, Go on. <coughs> Chair, I think David's just offered me uh, a solution to this little conundrum. Um, the, if you look at the, the application, at the plan here, and look at the blue land, 
which is in the same ownership, it is possible to go from this corner of this site through the blue land to connect to the footpath at this point here. So there is an alternative route available which the owner can provide and which, which can be conditioned use, using a Grampian condition. We can require it. We can require it under a Grampian condition. Okay. No, it's yeah. not. Um, the link would be provided one way or the other. That's all I can offer. Chair, I, I, right. I, I do agree with that because actually um, we could actually do a grumping condition because it is in the control of the land, uh, the blue owner. So it's, yes. it's not an issue for me. Yes. So am I. Um, I think, well, I, well you, you've, you've both done the right thing in bringing this to the attention of the committee. N at no point did, were the committee bothered about or even mentioned the footpath as an issue. Um, if we can continue to maintain the footpath as it appears on the plan or nearly the same as it appears on the plan through a Grampian condition, I've never heard of this one, through a Grampian condition, then fine, I'm okay with this. I don't think this changes the nature of the application as far as I'm concerned, so I'm content. Um, Councillor Barnes, I propose you seconded. Are you also no, content? I've got everything seconded, but, but yes, if you like, to okay. move it forward. Okay, so it will be with, we redrawn in terms of the footpath, which will achieve this effectively the same thing as we see as is actually in the plans. It's near enough. It's the footpath that connects everything up. Okay. Well, we've we've got a proposal to grant. It's been seconded. Should we should we just run it through the vote and see what happens? I'm happy with that. Yes. All those in favour of granting, please show. Three chairman. All those against. And abstentions. Thank you, Councillor Crump. Therefore, I will uh, use my casting vote and uh, maintain my decision. The committee, therefore, resolves to grant application reference 17 slash 01569 slash FUL. I expect you'll be in touch with me in the next few days to confirm various bits and pieces of this. All the conditions will come through you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Councillor uh, Barnes, thank you very much for being here. I understand you have to get away. We can move the uh, committee on to applications. application eight. That's okay. It's a bit painful. I'll just let people finish the musical chairs. I'm sure you for people to move around. It's okay. Right, so page 75, item eight. This is application reference. Uh, 17 slash 02343 slash FUL and is for 13 Shipston Road, Alderminster and is proposed extensions and a new driveway access. Uh, presenting officer is uh, Victoria, and I've forgotten your name, sorry, Chataway. <laughs> Apologies, Victoria. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. This uh, first slide simply shows um, the black dot as to the application site. The second slide shows in slightly more detail the proposed location of the site as outlined in red and uh, with the context of the wider area. This is a more detailed location plan which also shows um, the access to the proposed site um, which is to include vehicular access going into the curtilage of the site. Um, photos in the future will show where hedges to be removed to allow this. This is um, a photo of the site which shows the site in context. This is the application site here. This is the hedge and this is where the proposed vehicular access would be. This is the neighbouring site. Uh, this is a semi-detached pair. Um, the site is, uh, has a, a narrow frontage which is characteristic uh, of, of this pair here and the site, the, sorry, the application premise goes to the depth of the plot of the site. You'll also see on the photo that there is some um, parking here. This is outside of the applicant's ownership. 
This is a photo of the application site here and the neighbouring attached dwelling. Um, it's noted that the, the pair are not symmetrical in their uh, character, uh, sorry, in their design. Um, there has been an extension to the neighbouring property to the rear, which is approximately four metres in width uh, and is set back from the front of the property. There is, however, some um, attractive proportionality to the overall design, I would say. Um, and there is some architectural detailing which is characteristic, which is that of gable details. Uh, this is simply a block plan of the site which shows the um, extent of the proposed extension. This is the two-storey extension being proposed here, and this is the proposed location of the driveway. The main impact uh, to the road will be uh, on the main road frontage, Shipston Road. Um, the proposed extension is, I believe, 7.6 metres in width um, and would be, uh, and, and the existing property is 6.5 metres in width by comparison. Uh, this is a view of the rear element of the proposed extension as viewed from the curtilage of the application site. This probably better shows the proposed extension at the site and the proposed subservience designed into the application. There is a minor subservience to the ridge height of the proposed extension. Uh, and two um, gable ends proposed to the extension with a, a, a slightly more subservient rear element here. In addition to the, the side extension, further additions are proposed. Um, the existing canopy to the side would be de demolished. Um, this is um, an uncharacteristic addition to the property. Uh, also to the rear, an existing single-storey uh, lean-to would be demolished, which would enable space for a recess to be infilled within the single-storey rear element. The overall proposal uh, seeks to create additional accommodation for the occupiers, which includes living room space at ground floor uh, and bedrooms at first floor. Uh, this is for personal circumstances to the applicant, which is detailed in the application report. And this simply is um, a photo of the site uh, as taken from the garden of the applicant. This shows the canopy to be demolished. This is the rear uh, single storey lean-to that would be demolished. And this is the infill section. And this shows the existing dwelling house and uh, gives an idea of the scale of the existing property prior to the extension. Um, and that's it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Victoria. So, um, first speaker, Councillor O'Donnell, speaking on behalf of the Parish Council in this case, I believe. Welcome, Councillor. So, you have three minutes for this one. Thank Over to you. you. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Committee. Um, Alderminster Parish Council regrets being unable to send a representative to speak in support of this application. We have read the report to committee prepared by the planning officer. The planning officer and the parish council are in agreement on many of the salient points. The extension would still leave the property with a generous sized garden in keeping with the majority of other houses in the village. The residents of the adjoining house would not be affected as the extension would not be visible from their property. The houses on the opposite side of the road are set far back with a wide road in between and the proposed extension would have no impact on them. In the view of the Parish Council, the only residents who could conceivably be affected by the development are the occupants of number 12, the house on the other side of number 13, and they have written in support of the application. The primary reason for the recommendation to refuse is the planning officer's opinion that the extension would not be subservient to the main building as specified in Core Strategy 20. This is the point which Alderminster Parish Council wishes to challenge. The purpose of the requirement that extensions should be subservient is surely to ensure that modest houses on modest plots are not overextended to the point where the original building is either dwarfed or completely swallowed up by the new extension and the garden is reduced to a fringe around the house. 
We cannot see that this would be the case with this application. The extension would be no larger than those of other similar houses. The building materials and design are complementary to the main house, and we do not agree that any visual harm would arise to either the character or appearance of the existing house. There does not appear to us, therefore, to be any compelling reason why this application should not be granted, other than a strict adherence to the letter of the law. The Parish Council appreciates that planning officers have a very heavy caseload. Nevertheless, they are concerned about the way in which this particular application has been handled, particularly in the light of the applicant's medical circumstances. It is our view that this is a case where the spirit of the law should take precedence over the letter. We request that you grant this application. Thank you. I don't suppose you're really in a position to take questions for the Parish Council, are you really? So I think, given nobody has any, we'll move on if that's okay. Thank you. Um, Right, we go to, uh, where am I? Uh, Robert Hudson, please, and Sarah Bullingham, please, uh, the applicants. Good evening. Right, welcome both. Um, Mr. Hudson, I believe you're going to be talk speaking mainly, and you'll be just sort of here for answering questions, am I right? That's fantastic, thank you. So you have three minutes, and I believe we have sli the slides as well. Yeah, well. Uh, can, I, can I just, before we start, yeah. ask that we actually start on slide four. Thanks. Okay. And we're going to go to fair canter here, so. That's fair. Well, um, if you want to give us a sort of an indication when we want yeah. us to move on. Is that okay? Uh, next one, yeah. <coughs> All right. right. When you want me to change just give us a wave. Thank you. Do, do you That's great. Well, you have three minutes. Over to you. Okay. So thank you to the Parish Council for their support enabling us to present to you here tonight after two frustrating applications. Regarding imbalance, number 13 and 14 have never been balanced. Front windows, doors and layout all differ. This is easy to see from the rear of the property. We believe our design actually introduces balance with driveways at the front as with both properties. Could I ask you to sit back a little bit from the mic? Sorry. The following three slides show subservience, simplicity and quality of design and visual enhancement. The next three slides show the minimal impact on our plot. We could easily fit another family home in our garden, but want to use it for family life instead. Our plot is at least 25% wider than nearly all of the other similar village properties. The ground floor design requirements. Because of Sarah's condition, we need sufficient space for wheelchair access in all rooms. Redesigned stairs to potentially enable lift in the future and increase visibility of the garden and the ground floor rooms. First floor requirements. We need four bedrooms, two of which are for professional and family support. Again, as downstairs, sufficient space must be available in all rooms for ease of access for Sarah. Post core strategy comparable extensions that bring into question the application of policy with regards to scale and plot development include Bondi, shown here, which was deemed compliant by SDC. The property itself has increased in footprint by 117%. Our proposed extension is 47%. Also, also permitted on the same plot was a detached 233 metres squared family home, practically the same as our entire proposed footprint. This table summarises the facts. I appreciate they are quite small. The detached nature of Bondi was cited as the reason for it not being a legitimate comparable by the officer. We disagree, but let's assume that is the case. Our second Alderminster example is number 67 Halfway House, a semi-detached property and once again has a family home being built in its garden. Additionally, the original semi-detached home was approved by SDC for a two-storey extension. This inconsistency has left us baffled. Our due diligence highlighted properties with similar extensions, with number five closely matching our plans, shown in the next slide. 
Our proposed development clearly requires significant expenditure. Ten seconds. But it is a need, not greed project. Instead, it seeks only to provide our family with a comfortable, usable home for us all. We respect the age of our house and wish to improve it sensitively, turning it into the home we love. Thank you. Actually, spot on three minutes. Thank you. Um, okay, any questions for the applicant, please? For the applicants? No? In that case, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, no questions. Thank you. Um, right, back to our ward member, Councillor O'Donnell, this time. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. So, you have five minutes this time. Over to you. Uh, good evening again. Um, I'm speaking uh, wholeheartedly supporting this application. The applicant is fully engaged with both the Parish Council and myself regarding this application. There's three key points regarding the proposal that I think we need to consider. It's compliance with the core strategy. CS9 requires that new development is attractive and proposals will be of a high quality architectural design along with being sensitive to the setting and existing build form, which this proposal certainly is. Now, if you've visited the site, you'll have seen that it's an amalgamation of many styles with a higgledy-piggledy theme to it. This proposal brings continuity of design whilst also bringing the dwelling into the 21st century facility-wise. They're currently using a camping loo upstairs. I mean, the facilities are not great. Whilst the property is well screened for CS5 with landscape, with that it's got a high hedge and a fence, the areas that are visible from the road will be enhanced with this design and therefore improve the view of the property. As stated in NPPF, it is key to take into account the different roles and character of different areas, recognising the intrinsic character and beauty of the countryside and supporting thriving rural communities within it. Alderminster is a tight-knit rural community and the applicants are very well liked. Um, they're planning for this to be their family home for many, many years to come. Grandparents are in Preston on Star and their little daughter is at a local nursery. CS20 states that modifications and extensions to dwellings can enable homeowners to adapt their homes to changing needs and improve the quality of their lives without leaving their communities. And this council supports such aspirations. So let's support it here. The question of subservience is a tricky one given the piecemeal nature of the build thus far. But they've gone through design and tried to incorporate a subservient roof height and the extension has been stepped back. And as you will know from visiting or from viewing the photos that even with the extension completed, they will still have a sizable garden, room for a paved area, trampoline, vegetable garden, etc. So it's not overdevelopment of a plot, as has been seen elsewhere in the village. Also of note is that historically, as Sean mentioned, that it's never been a matching pair of attached homes. This application is necessity, not luxury. The application needs to take Sarah's progressive, degenerative condition into account. And put bluntly, her condition will not go away. She's not going to get over it, and it's just going to get more challenging for her. And she's very sensibly planning for the increased effort that will be needed to simply move around her living space in a wheelchair as her mobility gets worse. Sarah's not requesting that we fund her home adaptations or indeed agree to a walk-in wardrobe or a cinema suite in the basement of an ostentatious extension. They just want to simply extend their home to meet their needs. She is asking for the space to navigate her wheelchair around the house and the design to be open and planned so that she can engage with and be involved in family life and see the garden and watch Daisy, her daughter, at all times. Now, you know, in the future, she won't be able to jump up and join her in the garden, but as a mother, it is surely her human right and need to be able to sit and watch her. They're also having to consider space to accommodate the very strong possibility of installing a lift and the extra space needed for extra care and support as Sarah's condition progressively gets worse. And finally, I do have a question for the officers in general. I understand that you have massive caseloads and I sympathise with you as a clinician myself. I get big caseload problems. And as a result, I suspect that cases can become reference numbers rather than families' applications and the human aspect of an application potentially gets lost along the way. But I do note that the Human Rights Act 1998 is always listed as one of the documents you draw on when formulating your reports. And I would ask if you honestly, hand on heart, believe that Sarah's human rights have been fully respected as this application has crawled along and the extra stress level she's obviously been placed under, I feel are completely unacceptable. As a clinician, I have many patients on my caseload with Sarah's condition and a good insight into the negative impact increased stress can have on an already depleted system. The committee, I would urge you to please support this application. 
Thank you, Councillor. Um, any questions for the ward member? Councillor Fielding? I didn't get a ch chance to discuss it with, with the applicant, but the current house, I take it, is too small and there isn't adequate room for manoeuvring around with a wheelchair. That's a very fair question, Councillor Fielding. It's my understanding that the current living conditions are inadequate. Um, even just a stairway is difficult for Sarah to navigate and use disability aids, and um, there's just simply not enough room. Just for, it's, we almost need a turning circle, don't you? So it's not adequate at the moment, no. Any further questions? Okay, yes. The young daughter um, who requires supervision, is that um, for a medical reason or just because she's a young daughter? No, I think that's it. Sarah it's wants to be you know, a full hands-on okay. mum to the best of her um, I, um, I think we're moving into uh, personal circumstances. Um, any other questions for the ward member, please? No? Councillor O'Donnell, thank you very much. Um, excellent. So... Moving through this, let's move to points of clarification. Any? Councillor Brown. I wonder if the officer could tell me if there's any special circumstances been asked for in relation to this application, in relation to the disability. Chairman, the, the applicant has um, explained the medical need for extensions. What the applicant hasn't demonstrated is the medical needs for precisely these extensions and precisely this design. And it's precisely this design that's the problem. It's not the principle of providing for the applicant's needs. Thank you. Any other points of clarification? Okay, debate. Councillor Brown. Yeah, I think, Chairman, everybody should be given the opportunity to extend their own but if you look at this um, particular property, a semi-detached character cottage, I think it's one of several pairs of cottages on the entrance to Alderminster, which, uh, and uh, this is not a modest extension, it's a large extension. So it would detract from the traditional semi-detached character of the street scene, in my opinion. I think the officers have probably got this one right. Um, it's unfortunate because I, I'd like to see the family achieve what they want to do, but it's just too large for the character of the cottage. Anyone else? Councillor Crump. Yeah, um, page 78, I think that's... I think what the, um, the officer was trying to say was there is scope and feasibility for an extension which could potentially satisfy the needs. Um, so basically the officer is saying yes there's a possibility of an extension but this is not quite the suitable one that we're making the decision on um, and looking at the size of the extension um, when that's quite telling as well. I would tend to disagree. I, th I think that we could come back, or it could be come back to potentially meet the needs of the applicant and also meet the needs of the landscape and the building and, uh, and the, um, the scale compared to the overbalancing of the cottages. So um, and I, I, I tend to agree with Councillor Brown, it's, it's, it's not quite right. So I, I, can't, I can't support the application. Anyone else? Councillor Mills. Yes, thanks, Mr Chairman. Yeah, OK, this, uh, it, it, it does appear to look nice, but they are planning for their future here. I mean, to, to put a, a tiny extension on is not going to be any benefit whatsoever. And they end up having to move away uh, from the area, which won't do any good. I feel it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I would support this application, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Perry. Thank you. I actually rather like the design. I feel they've tried to interpret the gables and bring and I don't think it's actually overdevelopment of it. Um, 
there is a large space to this property and I'm minded to remind myself of the, um, in terms of consistency in decision making, on the other properties that we have given and granted permission for. I actually think this is far more sympathetic. Um, they're, they're recommending to use the, the materials that will complement the existing um, main, main structure. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also minded on, in view of the special circumstances. But, so I'm, I just need a bit more, a bit more thought, but I'm, I'm minded to go against the officer's recommendation. Page 79 shows the uh, officers saying that the proposed site extension will give rise to considerable visual harm to the traditional semi-detached character of the cottage by reason of its excessive width, which results in an overly large extension out of scale. It is a large extension. I'm not convinced that it, con it uh, is considerable visual harm, given the way villages often develop over periods of time. And I don't think it's overly large an extension given the site of the plot, or the size of the plot, I should say. The applicants make a good point in terms of the garden that the size could easily occupy, or could easily be occupied by another house. It doesn't sit perfectly, but I think I'm happy. I, I agree with uh, Councillor Mills and Councillor Perry. Councillor Fielding. I'm happy to propose that we grant the application. Do I have a second? Count. Count, do I have a second, Councillor Parry? My reasons, as stated, are that I do not think that it, can, it um, forms a considerable visual harm to the traditional semi detached character of the cottage. While considerable, I don't think it is an excessive width, and I don't think it is an overly large extension. My phrasing would be that in some ways it complements the evolutionary development of a village in terms of design, style. It's well, I think it is well designed. It's big, but it is well designed. And it reflects the needs of villagers over the, over the years. It's how villages develop sometimes. They're my reasons. Happy? The usual set of conditions, please. And I would uh, to agree with me tomorrow, and of course, I think re removal of, of course, permitted development rights. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, Chair. One other. Um, but this is beyond this, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the justification for this is to meet the medical needs of the applicant. Mm, the, no, no, I don't think it is to do with the medical needs of the applicant. I, I, I don't think that there's been a huge amount. I think this is um, broadly acceptable in terms of what we're looking at. But I'm not hearing that we really are, are going down on, the, on that route, I don't think, are we? No. Okay. It's been um, no, proposed and seconded. Because I haven't quite... Are we voting against the officers or for no, the No, we are voting... Um, the proposal is to approve the application as stands. Okay. Yeah. Um, those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against and abstentions. Two abstentions. Therefore, the against, against an, an abstention. Thank you. Therefore, the committee re uh, resolves to grant application uh, 17 slash 0 slash FUL. We can move to item 9. Just wait for people to move around a bit.
Thank you, Chair. This is application... Oh, hang on, let me introduce it. Sorry, I've <laughs> not got there yet. Sorry, no. Application reference 17-00034-FUL, land adjacent to the court, Hollywell Business Park, Southam. Uh, the erection of five uh, industrial units, including associated parking as access to include any necessary ancillary, enabling and facilitating works. Over to you. Thank you, and apologies, Chair. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this plan shows the location of the proposed units to the south of Southam and to the south of the existing units on Hollywell Business Park. It is a site uh, allocated within the core strategy uh, for employment purposes. There's the application site outlined in red. Access is proposed via the estate roads. Um, and Northfield Road. Um, members of the public and councillors will probably be most familiar with this site because of the large Tesco superstore there and its associated pumping, uh, petrol pumping station there. Um, this whole site identified here is what I understand to be the last remaining area of uh, land within the business park uh, for development. The area to the east of the application site has a permission for uh, a fire safety and training um, facility. The area within this L-shaped um, band is a landscaped area uh, full of trees currently existing which you can just about make out on that uh, aerial photography there. Here we see the application proposal. In closer detail, we'll see that these five units, the five buildings, are actually to be uh, subdivided into uh, 14 units. The numbering system here is slightly strange because they've missed out the number 13, so it says 15 on that one, but there is only 14 units. Um, <clears throat> The 14 units proposed fall within the use classes B1 and B8 and would amount to uh, 3,400 square metres of floor space. There's 64 parking spaces uh, provided within the uh, proposed development. No uh, unit has fewer than two dedicated um, parking spaces, but obviously the, the larger units have uh, far more than that. This photo shows the point of access um, within the business park. To my right, out of shot, would be the uh, petrol pumping station. And the site extends away to the left here, behind these uh, pink hoardings. Again, this is a view beyond the pink hoardings, the boundary of the site running along uh, this tree-lined uh, field boundary. Looking leftwards within the site, rather dilapidated hoardings um, show that the boundary of the site is along here. <coughs> it's just rough scrub land at the moment. I'll just break to a video. So that's taken from the point um, of the site access, so the adjacent building shown on the right there. This is the site. The land beyond the pink hoardings further down the slope will be the fire station. Coming around to the Tesco pumping station and then the neighbouring business park. Um, Interesting that these designs are uh, what has been continued within the scheme itself. Yeah. So, just turning to the elevations, you can see the proposed uh, are typical for the business park, comprising modern functional designs. These are steel portal framed buildings, um, with each of them being approximately uh, seven metres to the ridge and eight metres, 
sorry, approximately uh, seven metres to the eaves and eight metres to the ridge. It's the rear of the largest unit, unit two. It's unit three, four, and five. The committee report um, notes the juxtaposition of the application site uh, with the land required for the deliver delivery of HS2. Um, so this slide shows that um, <coughs> red application site, obviously purple hatched area for uh, HS2, not all of it being the line itself, but areas for um, cuttings and for ecological mitigation and landscape mitigation too. But nevertheless, an area that will be subject to significant change within the plan period. Uh, Chair, an update has been provided from environmental health colleagues, and this is described in the update report. It results in an amendment to the proposed condition number 13, which affects uh, the allowable times of operation for uh, these units. Subject to that change, um, officers are content to recommend the planning manager be authorised to grant planning permission, subject to the conditions and notes within the committee agenda. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, okay, go to our only speaker on this one, uh, Councillor Crump. Welcome, Councillor. Hello. So you have five minutes. Oh, yes, I'll need all those. Over to you. Um, yeah, I've got no real issues with this uh, application. Certainly big improvements to remove those shocking pink hoardings, improve the scrub, and potentially put some more screening and, uh, screening and soundproofing when HS2 comes by as well. So there's definitely benefits there. Um, we definitely need to ensure our industrial land is developed because with the 1,100 plus houses, we've got to find some jobs for the people of South I totally agree with the construction management plan uh, because that area does get congested at times uh, and we've just had a road built under section 278 and a roundabout further down the road is part of the development of 500 and, um, 236 houses and sheltered housing nearby. So it's again very congested but so we need to make sure that's sorted out. I'm also concerned about when the fire training service builds their training area there. Uh, again we need to make sure access is not impinged or in inhibited by this. More than happy with the hours um, that have been proposed in the update. Uh, and the only thing I would like to mention, um, it's not been mentioned in the report, is that area um, and Alco Cobra in particular have had issues with newts. Um, so I'd, that's not been mentioned, so I'd, I'd like to see some more investigation about that. Um, because there's nothing on there, so I'd like to see whether they've been protected and, and issues on that. So apart from that, um, definitely improvement to get rid of that shocking pink hoarding, improve the scrub area, provide some noise insulation when HS2 is built, um, providing land for jobs, job creation, uh, sustainable, um, so no particular issues, and we need to make sure we've got the construction management plan, the notes, the hours I'm happy with, and no impingement on the fire training centre when that's built. So that's me done. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Fielding and Councillor Brain. These are classified as starter units, are they? No, they're not starter units. Um, this, the ones that, well, I don't think so. The ones that are there next to it are um, multi-use, different usage. Um, tend to be smaller garages, garage units, um, but there are some bigger developments there as well. So I don't think they're particularly specified as um, starter units. Okay. Councillor Brain. It was just about the newt survey. The Watershed County Council raised no objection in respect to ecological issues, and I wonder what detail you have about the newts because I mean it is an expense to developers to have a survey done. Yeah, um, I just know that Alco Coba have had issues in the past with their, um, as, as David's put in the report, they're the nearest 
um, and they've had issues regarding developing their car park and extending their car park. Because um, I can't remember the officer, the lady who went on maternity leave. Is it Lucy? Um, Don't worry. No, um, the lady who was doing the Alco Cobra one, but there was any potential issues with the car park. Um, and there was notes there. So I, I just, it was just raising the concern, and I didn't know whether it had been followed okay. up on that already. Thank you. If there are no other questions, Councillor Crump, thank you. Um, shall we go to points of clarification, Councillor Brain? Same issue. The Alco site that uh, Councillor Crump refers to is this unit here, um, which has an adjacent pond. Um, I'm not aware of similar features in, in this site itself. Interestingly, the, the land in this area of the field here um, is identified within uh, HS2's regime as an area for um, an ecological mitigation scheme um, to potentially take on, on newts. Um, but as I say, there's, there's no concerns from the uh, county authority. Any other questions, points, no. debate? Councillor Brown. Chairman, this was here for size of development, no other reason, no objections. Um, I would move the officer's recommendation subject to the conditions on page 90 and 91 and the amendment on the update sheet. Thank you. Second, Councillor Mills. Thank you. Um, let's go to the vote. All those in favour, please. Unanimous, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the committee therefore resolves to grant application reference 17 slash 00034 slash FUL. And we go to our final application tonight. <coughs> Item 10 on page 95 is dual application references then one for a full application, one for a listed building consent. This is 17 slash 01284 slash FUL and 17 slash 0 one two two zero slash LBC. This is seventeen Avon Caro, Avon Das Southam, and is for the proposed direction of a single story flat roof rear extension and roof amendments plus additional drainage minor works. And the same thing of course for the list of building consent. Presenting officer David Jeffrey. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, this is a proposal for the erection of a single story flat roof extension um, and roof amendments to uh, 17 Avon Carrow, which is a unit within uh, the larger building, which is Avon Carrow, uh, a Grade 2 listed building uh, that sits at the centre of Avon Dasset near Southam. It sits within the conservation area, close to other listed buildings within the historic core. Closer view shows that Unit 17 comprises the southeastern side of the building and would formerly have been the butler's pantry, laundry, and boiler rooms of that building. So, this is the main frontage of uh, Avon Carrow. Uh, our application site is hidden behind these hedges, but it's on this southeastern elevation. Uh, a, a useful point of reference is this chimney here, which will be, reappear in a number of uh, these images. That's the southeastern elevation and the front elevation of the building. That's the same chimney, these large hedgerows enclosing the um, application site. Within the garden of uh, the applicant, and what we're looking at here is the southeastern elevation. Um, the proposed extension would start around here, coming towards the observer um, in this position. It's the same elevation, but further along. So that's the sort of finishing point of um, the extension. It's difficult to appreciate uh, in this photo, but there are um, buttressed um, corners to that existing frontage. Um, which will be replicated in the proposed extension. This image shows the boundary between number 17 and 16 um, with the existing uh, hedges and 
domestic paraphernalia. This slide shows the existing ground floor plan and the proposed ground floor plan. You can see the extension comes out uh, just slightly over four meters and is uh, nearly seven meters wide. The buttress corners uh, being clearly shown on the proposal there. In plan form, that rear elevation that we were uh, just appreciating in the photos is shown here, existing and proposed. Um, just to highlight what elements we're considering, we have the rear extension coming towards us here, and then some alterations to the roof on the corner um, of the dwelling there to uh, make it a more parapeted finish. The existing and proposed uh, elevations shown in greater detail here. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at castellating the um, parapets on that side there, an extension which includes the buttresses, uh, a detailed door and windows to match existing um, elevation details. The southwest elevations, again, this uh, parapeting being extended into a castellated parapet and then the extension repeating details found elsewhere uh, within the existing uh, elevations. Uh, a close up of the area to uh, receive the castellated parapet. Again, further area similar. And then there are further photos uh, continuing there. Chair, the recommendation is for the planning manager to be authorised to grant planning permission and listed building consent subject to the conditions, notes and reasons detailed within the agenda. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, right, on to our first speaker, Mr Anthony Eilat, please. Speak on behalf of the residents. Welcome and thank you for waiting so long. Apologies to keep you. I almost said it's my pleasure. But, uh... <laughs> right, well you have three minutes if uh, you remain seated for any questions at the end. Over thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Avon Caro, as you can see, was built in the 1800s and frankly little has changed in that time. It became a listed building about 30 years ago and since then not a single planning application has actually been agreed. It is now divided into 16 dwellings which occupies, is occupied by 28 residents. We, are, we had a, each resident is a director. We had a meeting of uh, the residents and a vote was taken on uh, having extension done. Uh, 26 people voted against, uh, two didn't, uh, two obviously were the, the applicants. Um, so that was an extraordinary meeting. Um, there was a flu applica an application to put a flu into the, through the roof uh, about two years ago, and the, it was refused. And I'd like, just like to quote this. It said, the addition of a flu to this grade two listed building is considered to be harmful due to the impact on the appearance of the historic fabric. It goes on to say, although not now visible from the neighboring buildings or the public highway, it remains important to preserve the historic design of the asset. Therefore, the addition of a flue, which by the way is about three foot high by ten inches, and there's, I would say, at least a dozen other similar items in existence, uh, therefore the addition of a flue would detract from its appearance and interrupt views of this elevation contravening section 16 of the Planning Act. Well, all I can say is if a flue under a metre high uh, three foot high by um, ten inches was refused because of that. I would certainly think that a, a building which is 240 square feet with a metre castellation at the edge, uh, a faux uh, Victorian uh, idea, should be looked at in the same, same way. Um, I can go on to say that there is, I think, an issue uh, with light into the kitchen of uh, number 14, and there could well be uh, a question of light into the neighbour with the 45-degree rule, although that is not shown on the plan. 
Uh, the lead flashing for the roof of number 17 is actually attached to the wall of number 14, so this would cause some damage to the building. There is a stone arch which goes into the back of number 1, again, not shown on the drawing. Uh, and this uh, existing stone archway actually butts up next to the stonework of number 17, so any disturbance on that, and the, uh, the archway would simply fall down. The boiler room kitchen, uh, which was the original area, this, this type of building was designed to have uh, an area that is subservient to it. So it is not designed to be made equal to the left-hand side of the building at all. It would completely change the original concept. So it's, it's supposed to be subservient. Now, I do understand... I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you there. You've reached the end of your three minutes. You didn't give me the ten seconds. I did give you the ten seconds. Sorry about that. Apologies. Okay. okay. Uh, any questions, please, for the representative of the residents, I suppose? Yeah. yeah. Um, good That's evening. Um, you, sorry. Um, you mentioned that um, the proposed extension would affect the light going into number 14. Yes. Um, but obviously you couldn't see it on the photographs. Are there any other um, apartments that will be affected through light or through being able to see the extension? Well, number, number 12, which as you look at the back of the building, is to the right of the applicants. Um, because it's not on the plan, we've not been able to actually look to see if it was a 45-degree thing. It would certainly, I mean, it, it goes out, I forget, about six metres or so, so it would certainly affect light coming in, but whether it falls under the 45 degree rule, we can't tell. Thank it's you. very close. And can I ask, when you had your extraordinary meeting and the 26 directors all voted, mm. um, what was the main reason for them to refuse? The, the main reason was that uh, everybody, that, not everybody, 26 of the 28, felt that this was a unique building that has changed so little since it was built back in the 1800s, and everybody thought, thought that this is what should be kept. This is the building which, you know, because we're worried that if... Uh, I'm going to have to stop it because I think we've covered the point already and I think okay. you said it. Sorry. All right, no, apologies. Uh, Councillor Mills. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Probably going on the same point. So are you saying that there are no other applications have gone in to, to um, put extension? So this is, the, this is the first one to come in? No, there was, there, there was uh, I believe, an, ex, uh, an extension application um, after it was listed building and uh, it was refused. That uh, was a different, uh, right. different, so different nothing, place, not, so this, not this number, not number 17, a different uh, owner. Okay. Right. Does that make so sense? So there are no, no other... Right. It's got a history, but that's it. We've got to look at this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? In that case, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Deborah Bragwin, am I correct in pronouncing that? Thank you. Welcome again, and thank you for waiting so long tonight as well. Right, you have three minutes. Have you, I believe you've sent us some slides. Okay, so if you sort of give us the nod when you want those on, we can now put those up for you as well. That's okay. All right. Um, if you press the microphone as well, that's the button in the middle. You've got three minutes. Over to you. Good evening, Mr Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Deborah Brangwen of Narvi Moor, 17 Avon Carrow, and I'm here this evening to support my planning application for a kitchen diner extension. When I bought my house, I was concerned about the size of the kitchen and spoke to the developer about it. He suggested I buy number 18, undeveloped, or extend. I did cons consider buying number 18. I've wanted to extend for many years, but especially now as my husband's health has deteriorated following his stroke, heart attack, and his hereditary arthritis of the knees. A kitchen diner extension with disabled access will make such a difference to our lives and give us room to live comfortably. I had several meetings with the planning department and consulted the then conservation officer, Mr. Marshall, who kindly sketched a design he would accept to help me. Unfortunately, I had to put my plans on hold. While my house is not listed, I'm more well aware that the rest of the house is a grade two listed building of special interest, so I employed an architect and started again. I sent my plans to my neighbours and asked for their comments. 
I was horrified when I found out that it, they had had an extraordinary meeting and were determined to object to my plans. I immediately apologized and promised to reduce my aspirations. I wanted my house to harmonize and blend in with the main house, so I consulted Mr. Parker Gulliford, the new conservation officer. Each time I produced a set of plans, I shared them with my neighbors and invited their comments. I never did get any replies. <coughs> After several discussions and alterations, Mr. Parker Gulliford agreed to my now much reduced plans with particular prov provisions which I will adhere to. I missed the Parish Council planning meeting by going to a normal monthly meeting. The Parish Council refused to hear any comments from me as they had made their decision. I eventually saw the comments my neighbours had sent to the planning department. I replied to all their concerns by email. I later shared my comments with the Parish Council and also sent them to you. We really need this extension. I have consulted everyone I could, particularly the experts, to make sure I am in harmony with the historic form of the main house and abiding by the rules. My plans do not circumvent any planning grounds or have a detrimental effect on the listed building. Ten seconds. I would be most grateful if you would look favourably on my proposal. Thank you. Any questions, please, for the uh, applicant? The councillor O'Donnell. Can I just clarify, how long have you lived at the property? Um, I'm the oldest owner. I've been there 34 years. Thank you. And when did your um, husband become ill? Um, I married my husband in 2002. And my husband became ill, uh, really ill, from 2010. Okay, thank okay. you. Any further questions on the application? No, in that case, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And we'll go to our last speaker, Councillor Fielding. <coughs> Still switched on. Thank you. Um, Five minutes over to you. Knowing that this is going to be a fairly contentious application, both from the parish and from the Caro Residents Association, I asked for a site visit. I was told that I, I was out of time. The problem is that what I was also told was every time you want to put a site visit in, you've got to put it in within um, the time limit set for um, comments from the parish or from whoever. I would like to organize to see a site visit because it is a difficult one. Um, I know one councillor couldn't find it. Um, and I would like to see a site visit and therefore put over to the following the site visit. Point, uh, well, uh, questions I was going to say for the ward member. Can you give a bit more reasoning behind your request for a site visit? What planning grounds do you think that we need uh, clarified here? Well, we listed, can't get from the presentation. Listed building consent is one. Um, it's difficult to, to, to give full planning, but I think basically the listed building and also the problems associated with light that were raised by the Caro um, Association. Very quick, I'm just going to cut that up. In terms of describe, if you could describe, uh, talk, talk me through the, uh, the plan on the screen. Where, where are we looking in terms of, where are we going to lose light, do you think? Where, where are your concerns on that plan? Well, this is part of the problem, is that there is, on one side, you've got the wall that, um, around that window that you can see in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that is one area where light will be affected. Um, the, on the other side, I don't think there is quite the same problem. Um, it is a small flat, it's a small unit. Um, and, I, and also along the back, uh, back wall uh, where it joins to the, na to the main building, I think there's also a problem with that area for, uh, as concerning as a flat roof and therefore there is leakage there and I think it ought to be properly sorted out. Um, other questions? Councillor Parry then, Councillor Mills? Or one of you? Actually, uh, Councillor, 
I know I bore everybody, bore everybody by saying visit these sites. I did visit this site. You yeah, know, it's a statement. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things, Councillor Phil. Then um, I don't know how well you know the parish council, but um, obviously they've objected twice on the original and revised plans, and they've not turned up. Do you know why they haven't turned up to voice their opinions? The, the chair of the parish council is currently in Italy, and I've just been helping them with regards to the Avon pub, which they, the village have bought. I don't know why others haven't turned up. I did ask that the parish council yeah, should that turn That is up. one of the issues we've had. That we've had people objecting. Okay, we've got the ward member objecting, which is the reason why it come in. But when the parish councils object, if they've objected twice, they should have the decency to send somebody or at least send a written report to confirm why they're objecting. So I think it, like that message passed on. I don't I know. Well, it might be a personal opinion or whether the committee agrees, but I'd like that to be passed on. Well, it's a I, fair I, point. I and made that comment to them. Thank you. If um, you'd pass that on, that's okay. Um, if there are no further questions to Councillor Fielding, I'm, I'm conscious I'll keep to the procedure if that's okay. Councillor Fielding, thank you very much. Points of clarification, or I think you're going to suggest something else, unless we don't have any points of clarification? Go on, Councillor Fielding. Move on. Yeah. Get, sorry. Sorry, Anne. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I always go and visit these sites, and I got there, and I thought, gosh, it's an amazing building, I have to say, I didn't realise it was there. Um, but I couldn't find the actual, you know, the, I, I would like a site visit. I think it would help everybody. It would help the, uh, the applicant, and I think it would help, um, the, you know, to make our decision a, a correct decision. Because I'm not sure, I don't know how many in this, around this uh, table actually visited the site. Yeah, it's one I'm going up. So if you haven't visited the site, uh, it's very, very difficult to make an opinion. Um, go on, uh, Councillor Parry. Well, my, my question is actually to the officers. Um, I'm very familiar with this site, which is um, unique. I would confirm it is unique. Um, a lot of the units are set around a, a courtyard. The detail of the Gothic, I mean, I'm not a, um, an architectural historian, but I, all I can say is it is, it is I've never come across a, 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 a setting like this. It's, it's, it's almost like sort of a Warwick Castle, but more Gothic with its surrounding grounds. Um, the point I wanted to ask the officers was a technical question coming back to listed building consent and particularly on heritage matters where because the the report doesn't detail in terms of such an extension like this how would the applicant be or the builder be able to match the stone and that sort of thing but it's also a principle of something that is such a unique historical site in terms of its architectural design, where it's got a history of having had refusal. I just would like some guidance on, because of the impact on the listed building, because it is a, it is a significantly um, um, site of huge heritage. We have gone past the three and a half hours time limit. Can I just, can sort of, I'm proposing that we continue the meeting until we're finished. Second, thank you. Done. Thank you. Uh, Dale. Chair, uh, I'm sorry to, to do this to you, but could I ask Councillor Parry to refine the question for me so that I, I understand what it is I'm trying to answer? I would just like some guidance and clarity with regard to extensions to the listed building where we've got a building of such heritage. Chair, um, it's a stone building. Stone is available that will match that. Uh, there are masons available who have the skills and the, the tools 
to match the standard of stonework that was previously used. I'm, I'm sure you only need to look around Stratford to see many historic buildings. The Falcon just down the road is currently being renovated with new materials to, to respect its, its significance as a listed building. Uh, I'm quite confident that this work could be carried out to, to a high standard. There are conditions at the end. I think they cover everything. I know what you mean. Right, okay. Um, we are still on clarification. Go for it. Just looking at my magic machine here, it suggests that there has been several applications over the years at um, this premises. I don't know if you can confirm that. Through you, Chair, yes, I can confirm there have been several applications, but I'm afraid I don't have detailed knowledge of their outcomes. Some have been permitted, some have been lost on appeal, but it has had a history of planning applications. Right. Let's go into the debate. Um, and it was the home of... Uh, more points of clarification, Councillor O'Donnell and Councillor Cramp. So can I just check? The, the um, property that we're discussing this evening, it, that's not listed, though, is it, that part where it was? Have I missed, missed something? I thought the applicant said that hers wasn't listed. Yes. Uh, thank you for that, Chair. Uh, the building is listed. That includes... Uh, yes, it, it includes all the buildings in the curtilage. It includes the application site. It is listed. OK. Perhaps, okay. perhaps worth pointing out as well, alongside the planning permission tonight, we are considering the listed building consent required to make this... Uh, Thank you, David. Yeah, the two run together. Oh, yes. don't they? Exactly. The two are running together. So a list of building consent and planning permission are here in front of you tonight. Councillor Crump. Um, we've heard from the applicant about her husband's personal circumstances. Were I mentioned in the application? They don't form part of the application. Um, all right, let's go to the debate, shall we? I'm guessing people want to talk about deferral, but um, Councillor Brown. I don't really have a problem with this one, Chairman. I mean, all properties that evolve over the years. It's a particular problem to you that our MP used to live up, Mr. Profumo, if I remember rightly. It was his escape or bolt hole after his affair with Christine Keeler. Just thought I'd let you know that. Um, I think the penultimate um, paragraph on page 97 sums it up. The officer, I conclude that given the existing design theme is maintained with all the external materials and fixtures, the proposed extension is modest in size and will preserve the significance of a Grade 2 listed building. Special interest and that is therefore in accordance with the policies CS8, CS9, CS20 and the core strategy. I will support the officer's recommendation. I will move that recommendation to the committee. Thank you. I do agree with you. Uh, any other people wanted to speak in this in debate? I'll, uh, I'll second you second it, thank you. If there's nobody else wanting to speak in the debate, should we just go to the vote? The proposition then is to grant the application. It's been proposed and seconded. Um, all those in favour of granting? Four chairman. And those against? Two chairman. Thank you. Therefore, the committee resolves. I should say that was for the first application, for the full, I presume, uh, application. The committee resolves to grant uh, 17 slash 01284 slash FUL. Um, I feel that the reasons are the same for the listed building consent, so I will propose the listed building consent is granted as well. Can I have a seconder for that, Councillor Crump? Thank you. And all those in favour of granting the listed building consent? Four chairmen. And against? Two chairmen. Thank you. Okay, therefore the committee resolves to grant 17 slash 01220 slash LBC as well. That was our final item tonight. As a matter of urgent business, before we go, can I just ask for a very quick discussion amongst the committee. In terms of start times to these meetings, it's been proposed a number of times that we move into unity with the other committee and start at 6 o'clock. Is, now, is this something we are able to do? I'd like to vote on it to see where we can go on it. I'd like it to be unanimous, otherwise it's not going to work, is it? So I'm in favour of it. Anybody else in favour or not? Hands up those in favour of moving to six o'clock. Okay, those against? Right, okay. Well, I want it to be unanimous because otherwise we don't have a committee that's going to function properly, so we'll have to come back to that another time and think about it. So we'll remain at 6.15 starting for now. Can I just make okay. another comment on a different thing? Yeah, go on. It's a, it's a Tom's uh, he is really. Tom, I've had a dull buzzing all night in my evening aid. 
which almost gave me a headache. And it got louder towards the end.